But let's go back to the source uh, in Mesoamerica, where maize is not only white or yellow. And to Maya the Playa, by introducing today's uh, workshop presenters, Claudia Alarcón Cacho and Veronica Vasquez Lopez. Claudia is a Chilanga based in Austin, Texas, presently. Um, she's an expert on global gastronomy and food waste. Uh, she received her BA in anthropology and a minor in Latin American studies from the University of Texas at Austin and has written extensively on food waste. She has presented at both national and international conferences and workshops and has shared her knowledge of Mexican food and culture with scholars, colleagues and chefs around the world. Claudia has two dogs, Eddie and Benji. The second one also known as Hunahpu. And she's a Steelers fan and listens to Rush and Queen. She loves sea cowboy leipä and she'd like to learn how to prepare muy kukukko. Veronica Amiyali Vasquez Lopez is a Doris Stone Postdoctoral Fellow at the Middle American Research Institute and the Stone Center for Latin American Studies at the Tulane University. As an anthropologist specializing in archaeology, she collaborates in the Yashnokkah and the Middle Usumacinta archaeological projects. Veronica's research focuses on pre-classic and classic Maya societies, uh, socio-political and cultural dynamics, household archaeology and archaeology of communities, urbanism, placemaking and ritual practices. Besides, uh, she has conducted research on worldwide culinary traditions and has led workshops on the history of Mesoamerican food waste. She also has experience in knowing uh, what reindeer mole tastes like and along with Claudia, how to pick lingonberries 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in the Finnish Lapland for yet another reindeer dinner under the Northern Lights. Both Claudia and Veronica have also presented on Mexican cuisine at faraway locations, including twice in Helsinki in 2012 and uh, 2015. And um, well, today we are going to have a three hour workshop instead of a three day one as in here. But I do hope that we'll be able to have these three day workshops again when the world is back to normal or somewhat normal at least. A couple of words uh, before we start um, about the workshop. There will be um, first a roughly a 45 minute intro talk by Claudia and Veronica uh, followed by a short recess followed by a hands-on cooking demonstration that may last up to two hours. Um, recipes of the dishes are posted online on the Maya at the Playa webpage. So you can try to make your own dish uh, back home. But without further ado, please welcome Claudia Alarcón Cacho and Veronica Vasquez Lopez. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Harry, thank you very much for very nice, for this very nice introduction. Yeah, and I uh, would like to thank uh, the organizers for the kindly invitation. Very, very happy and excited to be here and share this workshop with you all. So, yeah. The next time we won the playa, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's start and try to have some fun. Yeah, virtual fun. And I'm going to share my uh, screen. Yes. Right? Yeah. 
Jose Felix. Okay. So, um, as as Harry mentioned, we are going to share. Uh, we are going to have this uh, workshop. Thank you also to the uh, people attending this, and we would like to have this in person. But yeah, uh, let's do the best of the best thing. So um, we are going to divide this part, uh, this workshop, in two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be a lecture. Uh, where, where we will give a very uh, brief overview of the history uh, of the Mexican cuisine from its Hispanic roots to the blending of traditions that arrived with the conquest and the colonization. So in this part, we would like to talk about uh, how we've obtained information about Hispanic and culinary traditions. And we will refer some ingredients, uh, utensils, cooking techniques, and we will talk about some important agricultural systems such as la milpa and um, chinampa. chinampa. Okay. And uh, finally, we will talk about the Mesoamerican and European contact and the interactions that led uh, to a blending of traditions uh, and introduce new, new flavors, different flavors and ingredients to both sides of, of the world, as Harry just mentioned. And we will also talk about some colonial traditions and yeah, the concept of Mexican cuisine. The second part is going to be the hands-on hands part. And yeah, we will cook some uh, traditional um, dishes for you. And I think some of you may be cooking with us in yeah. the other side of the computer. So and now, um, we will start by uh, uh, by these questions. Uh, how do we know about uh, ancient culinary traditions, about ingredients, about uh, some techniques? So um, through archaeology and iconography, like images and epigraphy texts, we get some information on ingredients and utensils uh, mostly, and also uh, on some dishes we get less information on how this uh, food was uh, prepared. And for that, we also need to, I mean, to reconstruct some ev archeological evidence and use uh, icon, um, ethnohistorical uh, information and um, ethnography as, uh, as well. So talking about iconography information, we have, uh, for example, these amazing uh, murals from Calakmul, there are like this is, this is a pyramidal based uh, platform, all covered uh, with murals as uh, we can see. Sorry, I'm going to use the laser pointer. As we can see here, there are over uh, 48 uh, panels. No? Each here is covered with these murals, and some of them, or many of them, represent a uh, food uh, stuff and different vessels. So we can identify some functions of vessels. And um, yeah, some uh, ingredients. So for example, here uh, we can see this a very famous, and maybe this is, no, maybe this is the most famous uh, uh, panel of this uh, structure. Uh, this is a Maya uh, building, by the way, no, this local like located in the Maya area. And we can see here uh, that these panels are, uh, had these uh, present these little texts here, like a, a, a tole person, a ul, ul is a tole, that is a, a beverage made of uh, maize or corn uh, dough, dough. So we uh, can see that this uh, text is referring to this person who is like, like drinking what we think should be a tole. And since it is prepared with this maize uh, dough, we can see that this person here is manipulator, uh, manipulating this dough. And uh, we infer that a tole is uh, contained in this uh, vessel. So we can see different uh, forms of vessels and different functions. We also have this uh, other panel where this guy is also drinking uh, a tole again, and you should Trust me, but uh, the vase here has also a tiny graphy uh, saying ul, no, atole. And here we have different vessels uh, and a use of kind of spoon, but we think made of gourd. And we can see here the liquid. 
So again, these vessels to contain the atole, and we can see also uh, baskets supporting these vessels. And we uh, we have also panels means, uh, referring salt and uh, mixamal mixamalized uh, made dough and some other um, food stuff or or ingredients. And we can also see here, uh, like this woman here, but this is that old woman carry uh, this big uh, vessel that may be uh, function as a container and to transport uh, something from one place to another, like a function of the vessel as, as well. We have also uh, depictions like uh, these are uh, the Ma um, Madrid Codex from the classic period where we can see uh, these um, deities or supernatural uh, beings also interacting with uh, food related uh, activities. So uh, here have, we have the reference of a tamal, which is a kind of bread made of uh, maize dough as well. And so we can see here that uh, the food activities and the act of eating are not just restricted to human beings, but also uh, supernatural uh, beings and deities can, I mean, not can, they eat. No, and food should be offered to them. Here we have other examples, uh, later examples from colonial period, uh, the Florentine Codex uh, by Bernardino de Sagún, where we can also see different contexts uh, where food is uh, present. No, uh, we can see that uh, the act of eating is a communal uh, activity. We can see also that a woman, uh, while she's cooking, she also was uh, talk to the to to the food and and not the woman preparing food and and interacting so it's a very a social activity very important but in archaeology most of the time what we have really like we deal uh, in a daily basis with these uh, tiny fragments of, of pottery and shirts and we have to reconstruct them to understand which shapes are, uh, have these vessels, uh, vessels and their functions, right? And we also find these tools made of a stone like obsidian and shirt and other stones. And some of them were uh, used to process um, food. Uh, an important source of information in archeology span are meetings. And uh, we have here a, a nice uh, example from Palenque report where we found a lot of, of uh, shirts, as you can see here. I, sorry, I think I'm not pointing. Or I, I am. Okay. It, it, it is froze. It, yeah, I cannot point. So, uh, are you, are you listening to me? We can hear you very well. Okay, okay, great. So uh, in this image uh, to the left, down to the left, mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of uh, fragments of uh, pottery. And then in the middle, we have uh, these uh, river snails called chutes or hutes, depending on where you are. And even until today, you can have a nice soup of uh, river snails in Huten Chute, in Chiapas, uh, Tabasco, in Guatemala as well. And we also have a lot of uh, bones, animal bones uh, of deer, dog. We have, we found also turtles, uh, fish bones. So uh, these meetings give us information uh, among other kind of activities, but also related to how, what the people was, uh, were eating and processing as uh, food and the consume of the people. No? Sometimes these meter, uh, meetings are just a, a unique deposit uh, related to a feasting. Some other times are related to different depositions of uh, trash of a household. So we, we, we can get a lot of information from this. In a very, in very certain context, we deal with uh, tombs and offerings where we can find uh, the complete vessels and um, 
quite often they contain um, they they contain uh, phrases of uh, plants or organics that can be analyzed chemically to identify uh, what uh, what they were containing. So uh, they, uh, for example, maize and tobacco and cacao and chili as well uh, have been identified through this chemical analysis. But this is a very uh, special deposit. And uh, ceramics also contain iconographic information. As we can see here, this is a rollout of a vessel. And we can see here uh, two women and a man interacting with uh, something to it. We are not sure what this is because I think we don't, I mean, it's sex, it, it is not mentioned, but they are like snacking something. So that is another example of iconographic uh, information. And for example, we have this case of Joya de Seren in El Salvador, which is a very unique example because it, 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 this was a village, a Maya village that was covered by the eruption of a volcano. And it, it like preserved a moment of the daily life of this village, not like our Mesoamerican Pompeii, for example, but this was a, a more humble uh, settlement. So we can see here in the upper picture to the left, the, the, the position of uh, the ashes of the volcano. And uh, for example, uh, from, from they have identified the uh, basin sheet uh, project has identified a kitchen and we can see the reconstruction of the kitchen in the pictures next to the one in the upper left. I cannot uh, use the pointer, I don't know why. Uh, so we can see also the reconstruction of different vessels, containers, and uh, in the right down, at bottom right, we can see this vessel with a kind of seeds. And according to the chemical analysis, uh, it contains squash, huh? and in the bottom left image, we can see crops that were found in Joya de Seren, and they have been identified in uh, yuca or mandioc, manioc, sorry, and maize and other plants. So this is a very uh, great example to be, uh, that gives us a lot of information on, on ingredients and how a kitchen uh, would be confirmed, right? So in general, uh, different information that we can obtain from these different kind of uh, sources um, tell us that um, food was important in different arenas like social and religious and political. And we can find uh, food and yeah, uh, the act of eating is related to uh, ceremonies and rituals and feastings as well, besides the daily life of um, it in the household. So, and it is also important to mention again that it's not just related to human beings, but also to deities and supernatural beings. So now we are going to move to, to the ingredients and I'm gonna give the word to my uh, partner in crime, Claudia. So, um, Um, do you do you guys mind if we pause for a second? Because it seems we're having technical difficulties with the pointer. Sure. Ari, what's your favorite Mexican dish? Something that we'll cook tonight with Claudia and Veronica. Smart answer, smart answer. I, I, I myself, I'm very partial about, I love, I love the chilaquiles. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, love the chilaquiles, best brunch.
of course I'm biased, but the reindeer mole is really good. <laughs> With reindeer mole, I've never had that before. With lingonberry is even better. Mm. Whoa. I've actually made a, a mole half and half, half Mexican mole, half lingonberries, and it's still good. That's, that's fusion cuisine to the next level. Um, hey, uh, Veronica uh, and Claudia, is everything okay? Yes, everything's okay. I think yeah. we're, uh, I think we're good. I think we All now right. have a pointer. Our um, trustworthy director, technical advisor is, um, is helping us out. So it's this one. You can also just use your cursor if you don't hey, have the- Yeah, está. Okay, so now, now we share. Can we take a couple of photos? Can you see us now? Looking great. Excellent. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Technical difficulties always happen. But um, so well now we're gonna we've already kind of heard about how uh how we know what we know about cooking in uh, ancient Mesoamerica. Now we're gonna talk about what they cook. So um, of course, uh, endemic species uh, were on on the main menu in. Uh, in Mesoamerica before the Spaniards arrived. So we have fish like uh, the alligator gar. Uh, we have uh, small little reptiles and amphibians like frogs, iguanas, asholotl, and then uh, birds such as the turkey, uh, both kinds of, of turkey, which are endemic to the Americas. Um, mammals such as the uh, tepesquincle, which is a little rodent, and uh, peccary or um, uh, javelina, uh, rabbits, and uh, deer. All of these guys were hunted and enjoyed in, in uh, different preparations. Insects were also an important uh, source of protein in Mexico and Mesoamerica, and they still are. Uh, here we can see uh, your iconic uh, agave worms in a lovely tortilla with guacamole. Uh, Oaxaca's, uh, you know, living gold, uh, the, the roasted uh, grasshopper chapulina. Here we have a, a very interesting little critter, which is kind of like a soft shell freshwater crawfish that we call a cocil. But it's interesting that in a lot of places in the markets in Mexico, they consider it an insect, which is, I guess, kind of like a water insect, really, as most, most crustaceans are a water insect. And here we have like the sampler platter. So we have the ants, the ant eggs, the acrosiles, the scorpions, uh, the worms, and uh, a number of other uh, crunchy delights. Wild plants, of course, were very important and are still important in, in the Mesoamerican diet. Uh, probably the most important that we all know is the uh, prickly pear or, or the uh, cactus paddle and its oak and its fruit. And uh, quelites is the, the Mexican name for um, wild herbs and, and uh, crops that are not necessarily cultivated. So things like this would be herbs and spices, such as epazote and hoja santa, but also you know, things like greens. Uh, quelites in general just means greens. So imagine like wild uh, spinach type things. And then we move on to cultivated ingredients because after people settled, then they started uh, becoming uh, farmers and agriculturists. And uh, a lot of different Mexican and Mesoamerican ingredients that we gave to the world include beans, both uh, dried and green, and a number of different kinds of squashes, lots of squashes and, and types of gourds. Of course, squash flowers are also um, lovely and, and not just edible, but delicious. Tomatoes um, and uh, last but not least, corn. And uh, this right here, this, this you may know uh, as huitlacoche. It's, it's a, a fungus that grows on the corn and it's actually um, delicious. It's, it's considered a delicacy and in season. 
So for the agricultural technique, um, we're just going to talk about real briefly on how they grew the things. And uh, we have two main aspects of, of agricultural techniques that we want to discuss today. One is the milpa. So in the United States, you might uh, have heard of the three sisters uh, of the Southwest um, Native Americans, uh, which are corn, squash, and beans. And in Mesoamerica, that also extended to a number of other things that grew around the corn, squash, and beans. Uh, it's a really interesting symbiotic um, experience uh, at the milpa. But you know, of course, we don't have time to explain everything uh, right now. But let's just say that a lot of things grew in and around the milpa. So basically, what what we know now is that um, it's more sort of like a forest garden rather than just a crop uh, field. So if you see like in the cycle, you know, you, you, you burn the crops, you, you burn the forest, you plant your crops, your crops grow after they go fallow and you, and you harvest a, a secondary forest starts emerging and then eventually becomes a primary forest. But it's not just a matter of a cycle, it's also like a location. So here we can see, this is sort of like an idea of how things grow. As you can see, the crops here and um, the, the smaller uh, fruit trees and then uh, larger fruit and, and lumber trees. And, and you can really like see it sort of uh, depicted here. Uh, it's all like a giant ecosystem that all belongs together. So you see here is where the, the forest was cleared, the milpa was planted, the corn has already been harvested, it's already drying, but here surrounding it is a, is a forest that's already growing. And then of course, in the distance, you see other milpas and, and for, uh, further down, you see larger forests. So in this forest, you know, people would get fruits, um, lumber, and not only that, but they would uh, plant crops that would actually attract animals that would be hunted nearby. So it's, it's a complete interaction between um, the, the, the house settlements and the crops and the forest. The other um, uh, system we want to talk about real quick is the Chinampa, which this is um, a Central Mexican thing that has already been incorporated into a globally important agricultural heritage system database for the um, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Uh, so it's, it's sort of like a world heritage um, designation. So as you know, the Mexica founded their city on a lake and these are uh, the crops, the, I mean, the plots that they kind of um, built out of a uh, lake bed. So, you know, you have um, logs that are embedded into the actual river and then uh, dirt that is piled from the bottom of the lake on top, very fertile, um, nutrient rich uh, soil that you then pack up. And then you come in and flatten it out divide it into little plots, put in your seeds, and voila, you have some lovely little lettuces, um, and all kinds of uh, different crops that are not just grown for local consumption, but also for uh, commerce and, and to take to market. Of course, other things that ancient Mesoamericans uh, got out of the forest were a variety of fruits, incredible variety of fruits. So here we have uh, pitaya, which is known as dragon fruit, we have local um, indigenous plums. We have uh, tejocotes. We have guamuchil, which is a, a, a pod from a mesquite-like tree. We have capulines, zapotes, mameyes, nanches, more nanches, um, avocados, guavas, and chirimoyas. Just a wide, wide variety of things that were foraged from the forest and eventually um, sort of managed and eventually domesticated. Herbs and spices, very, very important. Some of them are very local, such as uh, epazote, hoja santa, achiote, 
but others are, uh, you know, worldwide phenomena, such as, of course, a variety of chilies that spread out through the whole world, allspice, which you would not have uh, finished piparcacu without allspice, and vanilla. I mean, come on. Um, that's probably our greatest gift to the planet. Next to cacao, which is probably really our greatest gift to the planet. Um, as you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's where chocolate comes from. It's regarded as uh, a precious commodity that, uh, you know, a beverage uh, of, of cacao was made uh, for the elites and the gods and the kings. Um, it was used as a, as a means of currency at one point. And well, today, you know, I mean, we all love chocolate. The next most important thing is, of course, uh, maize or corn. And as Harry already pointed out, there are dozens and dozens of varieties of endemic corn in Mexico, not just the white or the yellow, but we have different shades of red and pink and purple. And uh, it was the most important crop in uh, pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. Uh, it was embedded in, in the creation myths and the mythology uh, in the in in everything that that had to do with the creation of human beings, which explains the central role of maize in all the food offerings, in all meals and ceremonial banquets. We're going to talk about um, a few cooking techniques and cooking utensils, which are still used in modern Mexico today, but that definitely have roots in uh, pre-Hispanic cooking. The first, as Harry already mentioned, is nixtamalization. And I'm not going to explain a lot more because Harry already kind of brought it up, but basically it just means boiling briefly the dried corn kernels with calcium oxide to loosen the outer skin of each of the grains, which renders it more digestible, easily to absorb the nutrients, and much easier to grind into a dough. And as Harry also already pointed out, this is a very, very Mesoamerican uh, treatment of the maize and very, very different from anywhere else in the world where, where maize is consumed, such as South Africa, such as Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera. We can see that uh, it's been depicted as, uh, as being prepared as far back as classic Maya times. And uh, of course, throughout the conquest period and up until today, still being ground in a stone metate. Nixtamalized corn is the base for many traditional foodstuffs that you know, most of us might or might know, such as tamales, tortillas, of course, but other things such as tlacoyos and then the atole that Veronica talked about in the Calakmul murals and uh, so on and so forth. Tamales are probably the most iconic because we believe they were the first actual maize foodstuff that was recorded or perhaps, perhaps prepared. Uh, we can see here, we have the you know, early, um, well, late uh, pre-classic from San Bartolo uh, down to you know, classic Maya vessels, down to early codices, down to you know, up to uh, more colonial times and up until today. So the same ladies have been making selling, eating, and, and, and preparing uh, tamales. Some more cooking techniques that we know have been used since pre-Columbian times are of course steaming, very primitive uh, little steamer here, uh, underground ovens such as pibs and, and barbacoa, uh, reventado, which means to pop, seeds such as corn or, or pumpkin seeds, Asar, which, which means, you know, to toast or, or roast on a, on a grill. Moler, which is uh, grinding in a, in a stone uh, mocajete vessel. And uh, also cooking with hot stones. And uh, it, just recently, I read that the sopa de piedra, which is the stone soup of uh, Oaxaca, was named into the uh, intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO. Of course, we have uh, the traditional way of preparing chocolate uh, over a stone metate ground by hand. Um, this is probably how they used to grind the cacao beans back in the past. Of course, the, the modern day technique includes adding sugar and cinnamon to it, which were not um, you know, endemic um, to the pre-Hispanic uh, Americas. 
and other uh, you know interesting and important preservation techniques include smoking, such as you know things as fish and chiles uh, like chipotle, salting like meat, drying chilies, uh, coating meats and things in chilies with actually the acidity of the chilies kind of like acts as like a preservative like pickling, and of course fermenting things such as pulque. Some of the most important utensils, as Veronica already pointed out, uh, include baskets, uh, clay vessels, and gourd uh, um, spoons and ladles. So we can see that all of these items are depicted in modern day uh, Mexican markets and cooking. And of course, we have comales, which are the, uh, they can be stone or metal, modern day met, met, uh, comales for uh, heating up and cooking maize products. Of course, molcajetes and metates, which are still used for grinding and um, you know, making salsas, making mixed tamales. And now we're gonna, um, you know, have you already talked a little bit about this, but Veronica is gonna expand upon it. Yeah, so um, as uh, have you already mentioned, a few Spanish language a radical change occurred in the Mexican American diet. Now a lot of new ingredients and plants and animals uh, arrived to this part of the world, but uh, many of, of these uh, ingredients, uh, I mean, not these the same, but ingredients and animals were also sent to the other side of the world. And Europeans introduced intensive crops to be trade by and among colonizers for their own uh, consum consumption and also for the trade back to the old world, like sugar cane, grapes, wheat, uh, orange, limes, and some animals like goats and sheep. And uh, they also introduced uh, new flavors and culinary methods to this part of the world, like uh, frying with pork fat and candies made of uh, honey and almond, rice puddings and marmalades, and utensils made of glass and metal, for example. But when we, when we talk about this uh, contact, Mesoamerican, European contact, we uh, should not see it just uh, things introduced by uh, Spanish from Spain. Uh, we, have, uh, we should remember that Arabs uh, were occupi occupied a, a big part of Spain for eight centuries, and they introduced a lot of ingredients and culinary traditions, and also uh, the way uh, food was served and time, how many times uh, one should eat. They introduced uh, such uh, traditions to Spain, and not all of the um, ingredients and traditions that they introduced were created by them, but they were also adopting uh, them throughout their nomadic, pastoral, and military march of all places through which they pass. So this, uh, all these things were coming from different parts of the other side of the world, and they were introduced to, to, to this part of the world and enriching uh, with new ingredients. As we can see here, some like thyme and coriander, nuts, figs, apricots, so uh, a lot of spices, and we know that Mexican cuisine is very famous of the, uh, because of the spiciness. So uh, many of them were arriving from other uh, side of the world, and yeah, different kind of uh, uh, hazelnut, 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 and ginger, for example, to mention some of them. Another thing that came um, from the old world was uh, the distillation process. Uh, of course, the Spaniards brought grapes from which they made wine and brandy. But then soon they, they realized that the locals were drinking um, fermented things such as pulque made out of uh, different local endemic plants. And they figured out that they could distill such uh, products. So hence, uh, now in Mexico, we have iconic uh, spirits such as mezcal, uh, tequila, which is a type of mezcal, and other less common things uh, such as atol and raicilla and bacanora made from other different types of um, plants. So now, uh, after the, this contact and, and uh, this uh, introduction of all these new things, we have then the process of um, the colonial uh, period. So we are going to talk about some uh, transformations and important elements that uh, introduced 
these kind of uh, new things in this part of the world, like in this whole new Spain, that be what became the new Spain. And for example, monasteries um, where the monks or friars uh, lived, were considered, we can see them as systems of production and acquisition of food stuff because they had these uh, or cards or charts, or charts, sorry, or charts always, no problem. And uh, where they were crop, uh, growing crops like uh, plants from the old world, but they were also started to grow uh, crops from uh, endemic from this part of the world. So a song have a kind of laboratory for the creation uh, of combination of these uh, two traditions of plants. And actually we have uh, Fray Jerónimo de San Pedro wrote one of the first uh, cook Bellayo, sorry, one of the first cookbooks uh, including uh, ingredients and animals from the two traditions, so to say. And um, then we have these colonial kitchens that uh, reflect the mestizaje in like pretty amazing way, like in these paintings where we can see the combination of uh, the use of vessels made of clay, like the in the pre-Hispanic tradition, but also the ones made of copper and uh, the inclusion of all these ingredients. And we can see women interacting in these spaces and women from different cultural backgrounds and exchanging their, their own traditions. So creating new um, dishes, combining these different um, flavors. And convents uh, were a kind of a gastronomic labs. They were a very important, they play a very important role and they influence uh, a lot in the creation of Mexican cuisine. In these uh, convents where the nuns uh, were living, uh, also women from different cultural backgrounds were interacting because in these spaces used to live women like not just Spanish or Creole, but also mestizas and indigenous women and Moorish slaves that arrived with the Spanish uh, and black slaves and Filipino. And the kitchens of the convents were these uh, arenas with all these women who were interacting and cooking together. So they were also playing with these uh, different plants and different spices and flavors. So uh, famous dishes like the mole is said that it was created in this kind of uh, convent in Puebla. And uh, another uh, uh, creation of this convent are these uh, candies, biscuits and different kind of candies that you can get uh, uh, nowadays in the streets in Puebla, for example, or in Michoacán, not that are an important part of the Mexican uh, diet or cuisine tradition, uh, or tradition. And in this convent, in one of these convents, and uh, uh, we have uh, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, that was a Jerónima, not from the Jerónima order, uh, and 17th century, she was a poet and a writer and philosopher, and she was uh, like that amazing woman with amazing ideas. But she was not just interested in this uh, creation of writing, but she also was interested in cooking. And actually, she wrote a book, uh, a cookbook, you know, writing her own recipe that she was creating. And actually, she wrote at some point that recipes. <laughs> And actually she wrote at some point that if Aristotle had cooked, he would have written more, not like how important would it is to, to be more creative and more happy or happier. So uh, through these uh, cookbooks, we can see also the development or devolution uh, to what it became the Mexican cuisine. And for example, we have these cookbooks from the 18th century, uh, the new, the Recetario Novo Hispano uh, or a uh, new Spain cookbook. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, even if they, it doesn't have the Mexican label, they were already uh, including the ingredients and uh, not just from Europe, but also the local ones and also creating some recipes and uh, new dishes. And uh, by the end of the uh, 18th century, uh, we have already this cookbook that already took the, this Mexican label, like two manuscripts of cuisine. But uh, very important was this one, uh, the Mexican cook, El Cocinero Mexicano. No? Uh, uh, sorry. 
and that was uh, including uh, creating a different receipts and where receipts and where we can also uh, start to talk about the Mexican cuisine, like like the early stage of this conception that is very related to the idea of the nation, not as Mexico, not as uh, a, a kind of official discourse that we can see through these cookbooks somehow. But uh, the reality is that the women play a very important role in all these uh, creation of cookbooks because there were a lot of women interacting and exchanging recipes and the dishes that they were cooking at home. Um, so uh, that was like a, a, something that was not official. They were, they were just uh, exchanging tips. Um, Vicenta Torres Rubio, by the end of the 19th century, wrote a book that where she mentioned that they were including already recipes that has a relation with the pre-Hispanic roots and the in indigenous people. So before that, uh, other books were including these endemic ingredients and traditions, but they were not talking about people. So that is also important that the ingredients and the traditions are important, but the indigenous groups were kind of still marginalized, not so. And, um, uh -huh. So uh, into the 20th century, we, uh, we definitely have a Mexican cuisine at this point, but uh, as you can see, this amazing cookbooks from um, Josefina Velasquez de Leon, they, they really evolve. So Josefina Velasquez de Leon is, is a, is a, was an amazing uh, cooking professor and she got a cooking school in Mexico City that lasted for as long as she lived. And she's sort of like, if you want, the, the Julia Child of Mexican food. Uh, she had a TV show and a radio show, and she kind of popularized the, uh, you know, sort of say Mexican cookbook. So by 1946, she wrote the La Cocinera Poblana, which is, is, is specifically regionalizing food. So we're seeing an emergence of regionalized food, not just Mexican, but from Puebla, from Michoacán. Uh, the second cookbook is amazing, Cocina Mexicana de Abolengo, which means high class uh, Mexican cuisine. And if you, if you can see the, the cover is, you know, like a, a, a religious figure, like a cardinal or something, and he's being served an amazing meal by very European uh, Criollo uh, Mexicans, uh, you know, very high class. Uh, by the 60s, she was writing Cocina Moderna con los aparatos modernos. So, you know, the introduction of blenders and, um, you know, pressure cookers and toasters and how are Mexican women gonna cook with these things? We need to come up with recipes for Mexican women to be able to be become modern, right? And then my most favorite, Cocina Rápida para la Mujer Moderna, quick cooking for the modern woman. And, and, and you can see that it's like, you know, there's a fast convertible going, and there's at the bottom the left, there's a, the, the lady skiing, it just kills me. Um, you know, a happy, happy dinner party, and, you know, tomato stuffed with something fancy. Uh, it just, it, 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 the Mexican cuisine becomes worldly again, so to speak. So in the uh, 20th century, we have also this uh, important uh, indigenous movement around the 40s and 60s. And it was a cultural and political Mexican and post-revolutionary movement. It is important to make clear that this movement was not created by the indigenous people, uh, but by the others talking about the indigenous people. So it is a very tricky uh, concept. It was, it, is, it was very related to the creation of the Mexican nation, you know, trying to, to, to uh, get a, an identity of the country. And many of the, the indigenous uh, traditions and um, identity elements of those cultures were included somehow, but in, in a kind of romantic way. And uh, 
this movement also have a very important artistic uh, expression uh, with painters like Diego Rivera, uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros, Clemente Orozco, uh, Rufino Tambayo, no? and as we can see here, uh, there are, uh, we can see these women, indigenous women, like cooking, preparing some tortillas, and working with the metate. And yeah, I mean, some artists like Diego Rivera and the others were trying to, to be more inclusive uh, uh, and not just take some elements from these cultures, but it's still, uh, it, it, it was not such, such a, a success, a prize in that, in that sense. No? Um, and this all leads us to uh, 2010, when um, it, there was, it was a big push from uh, you know, writers, chefs, cooks, uh, different people who wanted to introduce Mexico as an intangible cultural heritage, Mexican cuisine, and uh, they eventually succeeded. So they based the, the, uh, the presentation of, of, of this proposal on the Michoacan, the cuisine of Michoacan. So this is the only cuisine in the world not Chinese, not Italian, not French. Mexican cuisine is the only one at the moment that is designated as an intangible cultural heritage. And so basically with this, what they're doing is they're saying, we want the traditions to be exalted, but also the, cap the capacity of evolving. They wanna make sure that the, the cuisine is not stagnant that it can grow, that it can change without leaving its, its original roots. So based on that, basically the, the cultural, uh, the tangible cultural uh, heritage cannot be altered, but the intangible one requires that it actually, there is an evolution and so while we still, um, today, we have um, a movement in which heirloom ingredients and traditional preparations are um, highlighted everywhere. So um, the return of indigenous ingredients, farm to table kind of stuff, uh, utensils and techniques. Uh, there's abuelitas cooking on YouTube that have thousands of followers. There's a growing interest in traditional recipes and home cooking recipes. Um, there are rural destination restaurants such as La Manali in Teotitlan del Valle in Oaxaca and uh, cooking courses and seminars such as the one uh, given by uh, Semillas de Dioses in Merida. This is La Manali in Oaxaca. This is my mom. Uh, it's 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 a thing now, right? That you know we're we're seeking. I, I believe some of the presentations later are gonna are gonna uh, touch on this point of uh, the Netflix Netflixication of uh, uh, Mexican traditional cooking. But at the same time, because we have to evolve to 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 remain as an intangible uh, heritage, uh, we have to we have to grow. So there's been a movement. Uh, for the past maybe 10 years, uh, even stronger, of um, chefs uh, as, you know, as far back as Patricia Quintana, who was, you know, she was an amazing proponent um, of Mexican traditional cuisine, but then newer uh, chefs such as um, Jorge Vallejo and the, the most famous Enrique Olvera from Puyol, that are in at the van, vanguard of, of cooking. So, you know, you're, you're presenting little baby corns on a stick inside a gourd with mesquite smoke, but it's, it's, it's presented in such manner. Things are pretty. These are escamoles with uh, avocado powder, right? Uh, beautiful local mushrooms, you know, it's, 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 Buñuelos de pato, right? So uh, these chefs are um, elevating uh, Mexican cuisine to the point where um, nine Mexican restaurants were in the list of the 50 best in Latin America in 2020. So um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a growing trend that everything Mexican is hot, 
But at the same time, we need to remember that, you know, we need to preserve our traditions, our cooking techniques and, and, and our ingredients while not remaining stagnant in the past and, and a relic that people come to see as a tourist attraction. Okay, and uh, okay, now we are, uh, we are done with our, our happy presentation. We wanna invite you guys to ask us a few questions if you have any. Um, we're gonna take a few questions, then we're gonna take a little break so that we can get our little aprons on and move on to the kitchen so we can show you how to make some yummy things. Um, we just, we just wanna thank everybody for, for sticking with us um, on our uh, nervous uh, attitudes and our bad accents and our uh, errors. <laughs> But we, we love what we do and we, we really are passionate about the cuisine of our country and, and we really are, are thankful that you guys are interested in sharing that with us. So uh, if Harry, you wanna, you wanna send us questions and we can- Yes, thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Veronica. Um, there's one- Oh yeah, question. and in, uh, during, I'm sorry, during, during the recess, if any of you guys are cooking alongside with us, you can go gather um, your ingredients. We are going to cook um, the recipes in the order in which they are in the recipe uh, book that we sent you, the document. So we're going to do the salsa first, then the sikil pack dip. Then we're going to make the pipian, and then we're going to make the, the milpa dish. And so if, you, if you're only staying for one of the dishes, you can take a break, and then you, know, you can come back when we're going to do the dish that you want to do. Okay, Harry, go on, friend. Yes, there is on, only one question at the Q&A, but uh, there are a couple of others at the chat. Um, there is an anonymous question. Uh, did Mesoamerican cuisine not use any sorts of oils in cooking prior to the Colombian exchange, such as from venison, dogs, hair, turkey, vegetables, and so forth? It is definitely, yes, they, they, they probably were in the dishes, except they were not rendered as fat to fry. So the, the, the action of frying, the technique of frying came from, um, from the old world. So it is possible that, you know, say if they boil the, the rabbit with its natural fat, the broth of the rabbit was fatty and, 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 and the resulting dishes had a, a, a number, I mean, a, an amount of traceable animal fat. However, it was not like they were rendering the fat and then frying their onions and garlic and chili. So yes, the, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure they, they didn't take the fat off of the animal, but they did not use it as a, as a, as a technique of frying. All right, and uh, there's yet another question and there are some comments um question from nick were tortillas before spanish or after that is a debatable uh, thing uh, do you think tortillas were before or after spanish they were definitely after tamales i mean it has been said that uh, tortillas are related to the tamales I mean, we have the uh, we have tamales in at least the Spanish period in Thailand. So, if but the question is, if we really just need the tamales to prepare tortillas because it's an old, I mean, in some countries they prepare kind of a big, very thin prep on cut stone. So uh, we don't really know exactly, but I uh, but. I think tortillas were made before the Spanish, uh, according to this uh, evidence and proposals related to the comal. All right. And there is a, uh, a comment from uh, uh, Cherry Classen. The Spanish diet, meat, wheat, and wine was thought to contribute to the survivorship of sp Spanish in the face of epidemics in New Spain. These foods made the man, native foods made the feminized body. Any comments on that? I think maybe uh, Cheryl 
could direct us to the research pointing this out and we can uh, discuss this further at some juncture. It's an interesting thought. I mean, I think, I mean, I think maybe uh, if we think about wheat and wine um, as more um, male related things and, 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 you know, things such as tomatoes and avocados and chiles as more feminine. I mean, you know, we, we have that, we also have the conception of cold and hot um, ingredients, right? Um, so perhaps, perhaps that is a thing. I mean, I don't know that it would make the female body. Um, you know, maybe I should just switch back to wine and wheat, so I don't have a big butt. But uh, I don't know. You know, um, what do you think, Beto? No, I, I, no, yeah. All right, we can we can maybe discuss this later. So let's let's move on to the hands-on part, and we can maybe look at the rest of the comments um, later on. So should we have a break now and and you set up the kitchen? That sounds perfect. So we'll see you guys in uh, ten minutes. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Harry. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Harry, do you read me? Calling Harry? Yes. I think it's a, oh, okay. You change the screen now. Yeah, you're now live. Oh, hello, everybody. We're now live. Hello. Okay. Okay. So we're sharing now, right? Yeah. Okay. So are you ready to prepare some recipes and have some fun? So we have. Yay. Our... <laughs> Yay. Yay. We have Absolutely. Uh, all our ingredients here. Hello. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. You see us? Now we do, yes. All right. Okay. We There are some other questions, but we can leave those towards the end of the uh, cooking workshop. So we won't uh, do it right now okay okay well you know we can uh, we can sprinkle the questions um throughout the as we cook um All right. because you know we're just gonna be cooking cooking is a fun thing we're, we're we're here just informal uh chatting and so feel free to sprinkle questions when you think they can fit all right and uh, we're going to start um showing you what we're gonna do uh yeah, right now cool. So we wanted to start with the salsa borracha, the salsa of the drunken salsa. Drunken salsa. Yes. So you need a beer, a light beer. You don't need like a heavy bit beer, really. And we're gonna use a chile pasilla, which are the dried version of the chilaca chile. Uh, as you can see, these are lovely, very fresh. They are dry, but they're not brittle. So they're pliable and, and, and fresh. We also have a very finely minced onion, which is, um, Veronica will tell you the story about the finely minced onion, but um, we also have a couple of cloves of garlic. And then we have some beer, some beer, and we have some uh, orange juice. So this is not really a history of the uh, fine uh, chopped onion. It's just that I was commenting to Claudia that is very curious that many friends that I have from other parts of the world, like from France, for example, they always tell me when they ask me about a recipe and I explain them something, 
and I said like you have to to mince the the onion. They are always asking me like in the Mexican style, and I always like what what does that mean? Yeah, because you always use this super tiny chopped onion that, like, everywhere, so it is always like this very fine. And I was not conscious about that, but then after those comments, I can see that when we go to the taquerias and to different places. It's true, the onion is always very, very fine. So that was just a comment, right? Yes, it's a comment. Uh, so now we're gonna use a, a clay kamal. That's a, a, it's a beautiful clay kamal uh, that Veronica uses on a regular basis, as you can see, it's already, you know, kind of like, you know, brown and, and black from, from use. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it on the stove. And we're gonna heat it up. You don't want it super hot, but but you want it, you know, quite warm. Because what we're gonna do is we're we're gonna toast these guys. So for the chiles, what you want to do is you buy them at the market, and um, you buy them at the market. And so what you want to do is. If they're, if you see that they're a little dirty, that there's there's grit or or dust on them, these are absolutely fabulous because they were so fresh. But sometimes they're a little dusty, so you want to either rinse them and 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 pat them dry, or you want to just wipe them down with a damp uh, with a damp cloth. And then you're gonna open them up, and you're gonna slice it open, and you're gonna do that. You can do it with a the stairs. Oh no. Yeah. So you can use the scissors. Okay. Kitchen scissors are great for this. So you just take the scissors and you slice this way. You can do it with a knife, but I do like the scissors because it's just a lot easier. And as you open it, you can see here's the seeds and the veins. So the seeds and the veins is where the heat lies, mostly on the veins. But so what you wanna do is you wanna just cut the core and then you probably don't wanna do this with your hands. You probably wanna do this um, or wearing gloves or something, but you can just pull this out and then it pulls out the veins. Now, if you like, oh yes. If you like the, um, if you like the heat, you can go ahead and leave some of the veins or take them out and then add them later. But if you prefer to be a little bit milder, you can take out the veins. And now I'm gonna go ahead and shake out the seeds. Uh, sometimes we use the seeds, right, Veronica? Yes, we can use the seeds and we are collecting the seeds here from different chilies. And sometimes are, uh, you can put them, like you can grill, uh, Piece of salmon, a fillet of salmon, and you can use some seeds to cover it. Yeah. Not that many because it can be very, very hot. It can be hot, exactly. But so we're just going to empty out all the seeds, right? You, you want to leave the, the stem so that you um, can manipulate the chilies on the comal a lot easier. This might probably be best done with a knife. I'm gonna maybe burn myself, but you know, you can leave a couple of seeds. Yes. So what they, you wanna do then is open it up and then you're gonna put it on the comal, like so, and we're gonna toast them all, right? You wanna toast them? This is a very quickly done thing so that they just get fragrant and pliable. You do not want them to burn, okay? Because if they burn, they're gonna become really bitter. And you wanna open them up because you want them to toast on both sides. So you wanna toast them on the inside and on the outside. So again, these are beautiful. These are so fresh. 
I mean, I mean fresh as they're dry chilies, but they're very fresh, uh, freshly dry. Okay, I'm changing into my Batman costume. Yeah, you are also going to need some um, orange juice. Like for this recipe, half cup. And you're gonna need a little bit of wine to put inside your face because salud. is more inspiring. It's more inspiring to cook like that. that, yes. Good old Julia Child used to do that. A little bit of wine for the recipe, a little bit of wine to drink. Watch her videos, you'll see. So now you really want to be uh, careful. So see, um, you're going to start smelling the chilies. You're going to start smelling them. You definitely want the windows open. You want the windows open. You don't want to like napalm yourself with, with uh, chili uh, fumes. They're going to be fragrant and lovely, but you want to flip them back and forth quite often uh, just so that they start changing color. Okay, so you, you want them to just kind of start getting a little bit redder. They might start getting a little bit that you can see the texture changing, getting a little bit crunchy. Um, yeah, like that. Look at that, like beautiful. I don't know if you can see the steam coming off from them. It was in the way from that. Open the window. <laughs> And then we're also gonna roast the garlics, right? For the for the uh, salsa? Not necessarily. not necessarily. Okay. As you wish, it's a taste thing. Yeah. For some of the salsas, you really want the, the, the chilies, I mean the garlic roasted. For this one, it's it's a matter of if you want to roast it while you're roasting your chilies, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring our blender. No, we are going to soak them in orange juice yes we for are like 30 minutes <laughs> so they can get like kind of tender this is easier to to blend them and yeah yes Ooh, it. oh this one's ready at this moment once they're toasted you want to cut the the stem off because now we're gonna soak them in the orange juice. So basically the toasting um, is so that they can release their oils and they can uh, get, get fragrant and um, just kind of release their, their essence, their, release their oils. Mm -hmm. Oh, perdón. I'll let you, I'll let you Rose, do that. And then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna soak them in fresh uh, squeezed orange juice. And we're gonna let them hang out for a few minutes, let them get pliable. It is important that they don't get over toasted, right? It's very important that they don't get over toasted. Because see, like, can you see here how it's starting to kind of bubble? Like it starts sort of becoming bubbly and, and blistered. That's exactly when they're ready. You don't want them to get more toasted than that. And, you know, kitchen scissors, they're my favorite friend because then you can just do this. Voila, right? Oh, they smell so great, you guys. I wish you could like smell this chiles. So I don't know if you know, um, but dried chiles in Mexico, we have like dozens of different kinds of chiles in Mexico. And of course, all the dried chiles are versions of the fresh chiles. So the cool thing about Mexican cuisine is that they have different names. So, a pasilla chile, when it's fresh, is called chilaca or chile largo. Yeah, we should get some chilacas. Yeah, yeah I know. Chilacas, so we, we should have done that. Yeah. But we will show you with a chile ancho, actually. Okay, so now we're going to just press these guys 
down with a little wooden spoon. And we're gonna let them just kind of sit into the orange juice. Maybe you wanna stir them around a little bit at a time so that they all kind of start getting soft again. Now they're like nice and crunchy. And as they oh, soak, dear. I, I yeah. love you. I love your scissors, by the way. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's a traditional Finnish uh, uh, cooking uh, tradition. It's called the Moomin scissors. So yeah, it, it, yeah, we have everything moving in this kitchen. Thank you, Harry, for getting us all moominized. <laughs> uh, so while the chiles uh, soak and get soft in the orange juice, Veronica's gonna <coughs> <laughs> that open happens. the windows. <laughs> Veronica is going to get started uh, making the sikil pack, which is a lovely uh, appetizer dip from um, from the Yucatan, from the Maya area, as you can glean by the name uh, sikil pack. And sometimes they actually call it sikil pack ha. So, so basically, it's, it is made of uh, the seed of the pumpkin. And uh, you shouldn't worry about what kind of seeds of pumpkins are you using because we have several uh, varieties of squash in the whole world. So if you go to Yucatan, you will get a sikilpat made of uh, the traditional and endemic uh, squash from that area. Here we are using the, punk, uh, the seeds from the traditional squash from the central Mexico, Highlands, Mexico. Yeah, show them the squash. Oh, sorry. <laughs> For example. So now we are going to uh, practice a cooking technique. Claudia talked about that. That is the popping uh, technique, not to pop something. So you can do that uh, using the command made of clay or made of uh, metal, the modern one. Or you can also use uh, a pan. So I'm gonna switch to the modern utensil and you heat it a little bit, medium fire, medium heat. And then we are going to put the seeds in here. Not all at all, nothing. You don't need to add anything to the pan or to the command. And we are going to kind of move it little by little so they don't get uh, burned. It is very important not to get them burned because um, it uh, gives a very bitter uh, taste, taste to, to the food. So you don't want that. And so the trick is that to move them frequently and also that helps them to get like uh, evenly toasted mm -hmm. or yeah, toasted. That's why the, that's why the pan is a good idea because it's more convenient to to kind of flip them around and toss them. Um, you know, once they start popping, you will see, and you will hopefully hear how they are going to start flying. They're going to start popping, and that's when you really want to get that handle going because you need to move them very quickly. There and they go. They start to get like little bit like puffy. Like puffy. Yeah. Yeah. They puff up. Can you hear that? Do you hear that? Yes, we hear it. They are talking to us and they are starting to dance. <laughs> so that is when the action starts. So basically what this does is it, it helps release the oil that is, you know, originally, of course, all, you know, most seeds have an oil. So what this does is it releases the oil and then it also adds, uh, you know, it releases the flavor of the seeds. If you eat a pumpkin seed or a peanut, if you, you, you all know peanuts. So if you eat a peanut that's raw or if you eat a peanut that's roasted, you can really, tell right away any nut that you roast or eat raw is completely different so it's the same with the pumpkin seeds so we want to toast them so they release oil and oh they pop yeah tag teaming on the on the pumpkin seeds because otherwise they'll burn they'll burn yeah so you want to uh, then to get a little bit brown but not 
too much. Mm -hmm. Good exercise for your biceps as well. Get a real heavy pan and see how you feel next morning. For the horse. Mm -hmm. Good waist exercise as well. So in the meantime, we are going to heat the pomada as well because we need also to toast or to roast, that is to your like, uh, the garlic, onions, uh, tomatoes, and the habanero chili. You can, I mean, you, you just need one, but if you are really, uh, uh, how do you say that, intrepid? Like yeah, you know, in, you can, intrepid. Yeah, you, you can use two or more, wish, but one, Gives a, a, a very nice taste, a little hot there, but you, I mean, you don't need more than that. We want to appreciate the, the flavor of the seeds and all the ingredients. How's it going? So to toast or to, to Roast, we can also use a pan, but for that, I really prefer the command because the command gets like really, really hot. And yeah, it, I don't know, it, I feel I like it better. I don't know you, but it's the same for you? Yeah, I prefer a command for, for the chiles and the onion and the tomato, yeah. but I definitely like the, um, the pan with the handle yeah. for the seeds because it's really hard to, to toss the seeds yeah. in a command. And at this point, when they start getting really, when the pan gets really hot and the seeds are really popping, the, the, the spoon is not always uh, ideal. So you wanna like lift them so that they get off of the, uh, off of the heat and they can still toast evenly, but, uh, but not burn because then the ones on the bottom are burning. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Claudia, yeah. Claudia and Veronica. Uh, Rick, Rick is asking once it finishes popping, have uh, them, meaning you, hold it closer to the camera. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're going to do that. So they are like where they are jumping like crazy. So you have to be careful not to lose all the to lose all the seeds in there. Garlic, chili to the command or to the pan as you wish. Remember not to add any oil or butter at all. You don't need that. You just, you just need a very hot surface. Mm -hmm. Yo creo que ya. Ya, dale señora. Um, so uh, it is also important not to let them stand in the heat without moving because you will also lose them because they jump more. The more heat they have, the more they jump. So here, mm -hmm. do you see it? Mm -hmm. They're still jumping. They are kind of, uh, they pop. pop it. Mm -hmm. As you can see, you know, some of them are, are definitely more toasted than others, but all of them have had some heat and some chance to um, release their oil and their smell. I mean, they're like, they smell amazing right now. I get a little bit tired, yeah. so yeah. More, so, more Finnish uh, Mexican kitchen. No, it's um, I can do it. Yeah. Just try it. Okay. And so once they are ready, just, just you just put it aside so they get cool, they cool. And in the meantime, you pay attention to your onion and the garlic and the chili. I'm going to move these here so you can see it better. 
where you need to draw. For the second pack, we are going to use also a uh, uh, bitter uh, orange juice, but actually um, this kind of orange uh, you can find it in Yucatan. It's not very easy to find in other parts of the country, but we found those um, yesterday in the market. So we were very happy, but we have also a trick when you don't find the bitter uh, orange, you can also uh, prepare a mix of lime and uh, normal orange and grapefruit, or sometimes you can add uh, to the orange and lime juice uh, a touch of uh, white vinegar. So you don't need to be worry, worry or sad that you didn't find the bitter orange. But in this case, we're going to use this. They are yeah. usually like very green, uh, smaller. They they smell different from a from a sweet orange. They have um. It's a it's a very citrusy smell. Of course, it's an orange smell, but it's not necessarily a sweet smell. That you can definitely tell that these guys are for cooking, not for either. So sour, so sour. You don't want to eat them at all. Okay, so through the magic of television, our tomatoes are more roasted now. <laughs> so actually the tomatoes takes a, a little while. So that's why we uh, prepare these. We toast these two before, uh, earlier today. And this is the example for you. So you can see like your very fresh tomato and put it to, to toast. And we did the same with the onion, but actually the onion doesn't take that much time as the tomatoes, mm -hmm. neither the, the garlic. And you want to keep kind of turning them around so they roast evenly. So this is to your leg, but uh, I mean, uh, frequently in the Yucatan Peninsula, they used to peel the tomato. Uh, but if you don't, if you want to keep the, the peel, you can keep it. There is no uh, problem. So it is just a, a decision by your own. So I think we we can see. start to chop these ones. You can see them. how like the, the tomato is beginning to get blistered over here. Chop the onions. Yes. So this is also, uh, I don't know if we have it in the DNA, but uh, we play a lot with the ingredients and the heat. And for example, my husband and other friends are always telling me that how can I dare to touch very hot things in the command? And I don't know, it's just that we learn it. We learn at an early age. Yeah. But that's how so you do it. We don't <laughs> recommend you to do that only if you have some experience in manipulating things in the command. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can use a uh, fork or tongs and or something like this. Mm -hmm. Spatula. Spatula. So yeah, be careful because it is very, very hot here. I'm going to so, check our chiles here. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Stir our, so. there are chiles in the orange juice. You didn't set the timer? I, I did. You did. Okay. I think So for the sticky pad, uh, once you, uh, the, the seeds are uh, cool enough, you can, uh, I mean, the very traditional way of, of cooking this, uh, of course, is using the molcajete, but you don't like really need to do it. You can save some time and energy and use your, your uh, a processor because you want to, to uh, 
get a, a powder that is like a coarse, coarse powder. So it is easier to get it with the processor. And uh, so your mocajete, Veronica, it looks amazing. Tell, tell us about um, your mocajete. It came from your grandma, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. That is also a very important, like Mesoamerican tradition, I think, um, because I have heard of these kind of stories in towns in Yucatan with people or friends I have there. And basically, I mean, in my family, this belonged to my grandma, that was a very good cook. And then she she gave it, uh, she passed it to my, I mean, once my grandma died, my aunt got it, the aunt that cooked better than the other sisters. Yeah, and yeah, my my mom never, never claimed <laughs> the molcajete. And, and after my aunt, I mean, at the beginning, the daughter of my aunt wanted to keep it, but my cuisine, she doesn't cook at all. And my aunt decided to give it to me. So it is like a tradition to pass the, the molcajete uh, from the woman to the other woman in the family line. So it is like a her heirloom of the family. So even if we have uh, blenders at home and we use blenders in the daily life, and uh, we have our molcajetes and they are very important for, for, for us. And um, when I prepare something that I want to be very special, I just prefer to use my molcajete. And you can so, see it's like, it's beautiful. It's so worn and, and soft. And, and I mean, this is like a beauty. This is a beauty. This is older than my mom's. My mom is a little smaller and it's definitely not as old as uh, Veronica's, but Lovely, lovely piece of, uh, of work. And then you can see in the, what we call the mano. So this is a mano, which stands for hand, but usually it's like a solid uh, cylinder of rock, but you can see how, where it's been handled over many years and utilized. Um, it, it's a, a choir in a curvy shape. It's just absolutely sexy. It's just so lovely. Yeah. Uh, and the old work better because it is kind of, a, how do you say, cured? It's cured. Yeah, yeah. it cures. It yeah. cures. Um, it's made of volcanic rock, which of course in Puebla, where Veronica's family is from, it's at the no, foot of the I'm volcanoes. Puebla. No, Sorry. your no. family is not from Puebla? No. <laughs> this is from Mexico City. Yeah, this is from Mexico City. I don't know if it is from Mexico City. But your family is from Mexico City. I always forget. Anyway. I feel that I am from Cholula. That's, you that's do. different. That's <laughs> right. Correct. So uh, it's all volcanic rock. So um, it's very porous. Um, but you can see that this is so warm. It is completely smooth. So when, when, when we mean cured is, is that it's been used uh, so many times that it, it's actually completely smooth. Lisa? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, in one, half you, in one hand you have to, um, no, in one hand you need to, to process this in the processor and, you, and separately you also want to grind this. So you can also use the processor to do that, or you can use your blender, or you can use your multi-head, as I said. So I will uh, work the seeds with the processor, and I want to grind uh, the tomatoes and the chili and the garlic here in the molcajete because I, I prefer the texture that you can get with the molcajete. So uh, we are uh, exper experiencing different cooking techniques like grinding, mm -hmm. toasting and roasting and popping. popping. Mm -hmm. We're going to do an exam at the end of the workshop. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, could you help me to process this? So, mm -hmm. I'm gonna start here. So the cool thing about the processor versus the blender is that you can pulse. And so you can somewhat mimic the texture uh, that you get from, um, from a molcajete, as we call it, martajado. So, um, okay, we can pour. Wow. 
You want the seeds to cool? If you if you uh, process them while they're too hot, the oil will just kind of like render out. Maybe so maybe you want them to be quite be... cool. Yeah, maybe a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Ah, they're still popping. So um, about the habanero, we were going to chop it before I grinded it. So we are going to take the seeds uh, and beans, uh, as Claudia did, and ex explain with the dried chilies. But for these ones, it is important to use a fork to do that because habanero, uh, as many of you know, is very, very hot. And you don't want that feeling in your hands and your fingers. And you don't want uh, by accident touch your face. And you don't want to feel, to experience that. No, you don't so. want to touch your face at all. You don't want to touch your eyes. No, you don't want to touch anything really. It's absolutely miserable. So in this case, Veronica, you're, um, you don't peel the tomatoes, but some people like to peel the tomatoes. Yeah, I was thinking about one to peel it, but I like the-, the I like the tart taste. Yeah, yes, exactly. I do too. So again, that's, uh, that's up to you. And this is um, a good moment to, to talk about authentic versus traditional, because a lot of people talk about authentic Mexican food, but there's no such a thing as authentic Mexican food because what's authentic to me is not authentic to Veronica, even though we're both from Mexico City. And it's <laughs> not about authenticity. It's about no, it's about tradition. Traditions. Exacto. So, so uh, when you say authentic Mexican food, that's really almost like an oxymoron. It's really not, it's not a correct term. Because my recipe for, for uh, mole is as, as authentic as Veronica's is. We just grew up in a different household that has different traditions and enjoys a different level of heat or you know whether you want the skin on your tomatoes or not, whether you like your onion chard in your sickle pack or you want it raw. So it's, it's authentic is, 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 is dumb. You know, we, we really should speak about tradition. We should speak about traditional things. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and it's uh, like also uh, important to be like tolerant and respect the other uh, household traditions. So when I say like, uh, for me, this kind of dish has to be like, for example, so to say pipian, it should be green. No, right. it shouldn't be. It's just the way you learn it at home. Uh, your mom preferred to cook it that way and you adapt the, that fl flavor. So you may prefer that, but that doesn't mean it is uh, any less uh, traditional or any better or yeah. and nothing, it, nothing is, uh, it's not a wrong way to do it. Yeah. And actually it's nicer to hear how, I mean, it, it's, I think it's better to ask how do this dish is cooked at your home and you can learn about things and maybe you can adopt some things. And yeah, like uh, play with your recipes and create new ones like you were talking about evolution of cooking. So maybe it's not something like it evolves, but you play with it and you create. And you create you and add your own sazon to it. You yeah. are, add your own flavor to it. Like, um, for instance, um, you know, we all have like the grandma recipes, right? So, you know, my, my grandma's recipe for the Christmas codfish, that was kind of like what the family, you know, we had that in the family forever and ever. And we always had that same recipe because my grandma used to make it. But when she passed, she gave the recipe to my nephew who loves to cook. So now my, my, uh, 40 year old nephew is in charge of cooking the, the Christmas codfish. And he's like, well, you know, I know my grandma didn't put red wine in it, but I like red wine. I'm gonna put a little red wine in it. And, and so now, so now it's not my grandma's recipe, but it's Ivan's recipe. And that's what lovely, what's lovely because when Ivan's son grows up, I'm hoping that he likes to cook. He's gonna say, well, this is my dad's recipe, which he adapted from his yeah. great grandmother's recipe. And so that's how you evolve yeah. and keep cuisine growing because otherwise it's just stagnant. We'll be eating the same stuff, you know? 
Yeah, and that's why it's also important to uh, remember when we were talking about uh, cookbooks, and I mentioned that the women, women play a very important role because they were interacting, women from different parts of the country, they were uh, mailing in a traditional way, they were mailing uh, one to each other and exchanging recipes and tips and explaining, sharing the ways they were cooking at home. And somehow that led to create these uh, cookbooks and create these, uh, I mean, at the end, the cookbook is like an officialization of a recipe. Exactly, you know? because, it's a standardization yeah. of a recipe. Yeah because you get, I mean, little by little, you start to get like measurements. At the beginning, they were using things like just, um, how do you say this? Like a pinch, know, a pinch. Yeah, a pinch of this yeah. or a good measure of yeah. butter. It's like, yeah. okay, what's that? Uh, add to your like. Not yeah, to your liking, like, you know, is... like salt. Like we say now, like salt to taste. But, but before it was like, add butter to your taste. It's like, duh. How much butter is that? <laughs> yeah, and now a base is not only to your taste, but to your health, right? Well, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I think our seeds are cool enough to blend. And what do you think of our chili over here, Veronica? Yeah, I think it's fine. We can do it? Yeah. Okay, pork. Can you turn the Yes, yes, please? I did. Ow. Sorry, um, I'm going to move to the camera. So we can, uh, as I said, uh, it is important to use a fork to play with the habanero and also other chilies like jalapeno, that sometimes are also hot. And we want to remove the seeds and the veins. It doesn't have too many seeds actually. Um, yeah, I think so. It doesn't matter if you, the habanero you are using for this is red or orange or green or yellow. That is not like really a point here. And now we are going to chop it. Instead, <laughs> So uh, I, I think it's better to mince it, not just to chop it. As you can see, I chopped the onion too big. So now I'm not able to blend it as well as, as it should be. So go small. And that will go small. No, yeah, come. because actually sticky fat is a kind of dip. It's uh, a dip. And, and we are, you are going to, I mean, we can eat it with totopos or with, um, uh, crackers if you want, but of course the tacos is even better. So it's just like to, to dip it. And it is very traditional from the, uh, you can eat it in the cantinas in, in Yucatan. So it is a very nice snack. It is. It is a, a big, uh, baggy one. So as you can see, we don't, don't add any uh, meat product. Meat or um, I, I but you can if you want yeah, to, yeah. right? Like, do some yeah. people make it with a chicken broth? Yeah, because we're going to add some water here, but you can use chicken broth if you, if you want or, or keep it baggy. Blend the seeds? Yeah. Okay, all right. We're going to blend the seeds, right? Uh, I don't know your, uh, I don't know mm -hmm. your food processor. Thank 
Okay, that's the peppers. A ver, pero show me how yours works because. Interesting. Huh? Let's see, uh -huh. and then you want to like maybe just kind of pause it, but it does have a texture to it, like you can replicate the texture of the multiple. And since I messed up the onions, maybe we can put it in there and pulse it a little, if you want. Okay. Like chunky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we said, this is to your taste. If you want it uh, like thinner, you can blend it all with the uh, processor. If you want it uh, a little bit coarse, coarsey, just uh, use a molcajete. Or if you don't have a molcajete, you just also can use a mortar that is easier to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of those large time mortars would work. So I think basically these are ready, right? So we can show them like how they're supposed to look. If we are going to use this for part, that we have to move this. We have to move this to other parts, right? Yeah. Well, if Harry, if anybody has questions, now is a good time for the uh, fiddle with this thing. Yeah, there was there was one, um, not really super related to what you are doing right now, but uh, the question is: Has consuming the traditional foods led to any widespread metabolic issues such as diabetes? Has the cuisine evolved as a result? This is from Rick. You know, Rick, I don't know. Um, I think it really does depend on, um, on the amount of uh, traditional cuisine. Of course, um, you know, some of it might be high in fat, but that's, um, you know, a lot of the frying of the things, um, a lot of the frying of the things might might lead to diabetes but you know like i am not quite a nutritionist uh neither is vero so but i don't know what do you think i think i mean and, and i think uh, the statistics of uh, diabetic person people in mexico are related also to the industrialization of the food not necessarily so, to the traditional food. no actually i mean i mean the very traditional food uh i mean uh, when we as we mentioned, they uh, the Hispanic uh, world didn't fry, didn't fry, didn't yeah. have sugar, didn't have sugar, but actually processed sugar. Yeah, actually. And and then, uh, uh, according to what, with what I have read, it is more related to the industrialization of the food that even even as some products, processed products. That you don't expect to have sugar, they all have sugar, mm -hmm. you know? and they are also including other ingredients that are not good. And I don't, I have also sent, uh, certain questions uh, about uh, the consume of uh, wheat flour mm -hmm. because I think uh, it is not easy to digest by many um, local uh, or native people or people with this kind of DNA that we have a lot of problems of uh, gluten uh, intolerance, yeah. right? That I don't see people from Italy, for example. So maybe it's also like a mixture of different traditions. Uh, uh, it's part of the globalization, maybe, like including some um, ingredients in the diet that uh, we are not um, genetically um, prepared to prepared. deal with. And, and some people, develop a, toler a tolerance, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. But um, about diabetic uh, situations, I think it is very close related to the industrialization. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that the, the native traditional foods are the culprit in, um, in the rise of obesity or diabetes. I think it's things like a lot of fat, a lot of processed foods, and uh, a lot of sugar. Yeah. So now we're going to blend 
going to pause a little bit on this thing. No, Veronica, you know, Felix was just pointing out that maybe some of the traditional candies, mm -hmm. like, you know, like we were talking about the things that the Puebla, maybe, you know, things like uh, mango from Chile, like, you know, things that people eat that are kind of local and kind of traditional are still maybe low for sure. I mean, Mexicans like their sweets. Yeah, let's not be naive about it, no? Nos gusta el gusto. Yes. Yes. Okay, I think we can make it with this. But yeah, but I think it is a very important thing to, to, to think about. No? And actually, I don't know if you uh, know that uh, after the pandemic, the government of Mexico decided to, I mean, and because most of the people that were like, were dying because of the, uh, the COVID-19, uh, it was people that has diabetes. And now the government uh, had this, um, in every uh, processed food that we get at the supermarket on, or anywhere, the, the, pro, the products show include like labels saying that it, ha, it is uh, high in sugar, high in sugar, high, high in sodium, mm -hmm. like a way to try that people change uh, consume habits and care more about what they eat. And also related to, to this uh, thing that was uh, mentioning before that there are many products that had a lot of sugar, but they don't support supposed to contain sugar, right? So. Yeah, just thinking about that. <laughs> so now we are going to add some um, bitter orange juice. We just need like um, water. What's in the other? Just need a quarter of a cup here. And some salt. Also be careful with that. It's also to your taste, but then get too crazy about that. So you mix this uh, a little bit. Then we are going to add the grinded seeds. And we are going to start to mix it. So um, as, I, as we mentioned before, you can decide how thick you want it or thinner or thin. So I can add the water yet. Because it is better to add it, uh, add it like little by little, so you can take decisions in the process. And actually, you have to let it simm. I mean, once you add the orange juice and the mixture of tomatoes, it is good to let it simm for a while. So the seeds absorb the, the the other mixture. 
So before adding uh, water, I'm going to let it sit about 10 minutes. And in the meantime, we can start to cook the next dish that is a uh, pipián rojo. Salsa borracha. Ah, sorry, salsa borracha, yeah. yeah right. Now our chiles are soaking in the, in the orange juice and they're ready. So, and in this last uh, step, you can uh, still grind some onions uh, to your leg. There are still some chunk onions, but yeah, we are getting there. Beautiful. Thank you. So I'm going to move this to this other side so Claudia can work the salsa borracha. Okay, so now we have our, um, our chiles here and they've been soaking in the orange juice. You can see the orange juice has um, become sort of uh, brownish. It's gotten the, the chile infusion in it and the chiles are a little bit softer. So they'll be easier to, to blend on in the blender. So we're gonna do that. Okay, we have a blender. We're gonna put our chiles in here, of course, with the orange juice, because that's what's gonna help it blend. And then the trick that makes it borracha is that we add a little bit of beer. Now, traditionally, the salsa should be made with pulque. This is a salsa that is traditionally used with the classic Sunday barbacoa. But because we can't um, find pulque so readily easily available on a you know Thursday in Mexico City. We're just gonna use some beer. So any any traditional Mexican type lager, half a cup. Now I'll give it the fermented taste that we're kind of aiming for, right? It's not necessarily the alcohol, but it's a is a sort of like fermented taste that we're going for here. Because pulque is um, you know, quite acidic. Uh, it has some sweetness, but not a lot because it's been uh, it's been turned into alcohol and it's a it's a nice and light alcohol so it's not abrasive and so here we have our beer half a cup it's going in there we have our salt and again salt is a thing that you know you can add as much as you want so like your recipe says one teaspoon so we're gonna do that. But if you like more salt, if you like less salt, whatever you like. And then we have two cloves of garlic over here somewhere. Where do they go? Mm -hmm. Los movimos. Anyway, yeah. two cloves of garlic. These are a little big, but- um, Do you want smaller? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do one big one. That's again, Gosh. cooking, you know? I mean, when you have a garlic that's this big, maybe one is two garlics. We just found really lovely garlics today at the market. Um, okay, so you have your salt, your beer, your chiles, your orange juice, and you rock. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna rock this. Maybe a little bit more. You don't want it liquid. You want it to have a chunky texture. Maybe a little more water. Poquito más agua, what do you think? 
Can I use this? Yes. Maybe a little, a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? So it's a little bit thick. It's kind of like an adobo okay. here. Yeah. 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 It's perfect. Sorry. So it's a little bit like it's uh, it's thicker, like an adobo. This this texture would be good for um, rubbing in some meat before you stick it in the oven or actually in the barbecue. But we're just gonna add a little bit more beer because beer. Maybe a little bit more. <laughs> Did you add the orange juice? See, orange. the orange juice is okay. All right, now it's perfect. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, so you want it so that it has like a salsa kind of consistency, but not too runny, not too thick. So this is usually served in a taco with barbacoa, but you know what? It's really awesome with any roasted meat. It's really great with um, any kind of taco or with just some crisps to, to, to eat. Uh, so we're gonna pour it into our container and then we're gonna add our chopped onion. Bah. Yeah. This salsa also will keep in the fridge in a jar uh, or in a sealed um, container, such as like a Tupperware cup type of thing for a week or so, if you can stop yourself from eating it. Um, you also wanna taste it, right? You wanna make sure it's got enough salt. Oh, wow, it's yummy. Yeah. It's so good. Yes. And then you're going to add your chopped onion. That's going to give it a texture. Oh, maybe a small container, but you get the picture. Oh my God, it's so good, you guys. It is spicy, but the pasilla chile is not one of those chiles that is like super hot. It just has like a really nice afterburn. Um, it has a nice burn on the on the on the first taste, but the, the it, it it lingers like it, it's it's just a warmth that is a uh, very pleasant. To my taste, it might want a little more salt, but let me see what Veronica thinks. I'm gonna use a nice blue corn totopo. We don't call these nachos, we call them totopos, at least like in Mexico, that is the word, but it is basically the same thing. I like it the way it is, but the truth is, it is a little bit hot. And the truth is, uh, I don't eat that much salt. So that's just to your like. I guess, so I, again, you it's to, to your liking. If you, you like more salt, you can add more salt. It's it's but all to taste. Really nice. It's really, really nice, yeah. right? You can taste the orange, you can taste the beer, and of course the yummy chocolatey pasilla chiles. They're quite warm. Um, that's another thing about chiles is that sometimes they're not as hot, but sometimes they're really hot. Yeah. And the smoky taste is really, really nice. Yes. So, yeah. I like it very much. You can also use this for a quesadilla. I mean, as Claudia mentioned, it is very First traditional to it with barbecue. Yes. A barbacoa, not barbecue, but barbacoa. But also with a quesadilla, just like tortilla with cheese. It's nice or any meat as well. Yeah, it's really versatile. So it's, um, you know, it will go well with uh, with a steak, if you're grilling a steak on the side, this would be really nice, or um, a chicken breast. I mean, I think it would even go with a good 
sturdy fish like a salmon, you know, I like a little bit. It's just really a versatile sauce. So now we are done with our first, uh, sorry, our first um, dish, our salsa borracha. And we can put this aside. We are about to be done with uh, the sikil pad. I just chop uh, some coriander, cilantro. And now I'm gonna chop some, I mean, this you can use chives, chives, but now uh, I'm using the how we say this the stem of a uh, onion. Just there is a specific name. For this. Just green onion, green onion, spring onion, green onion stems. They work just as well. Just mince them real fine, like you know, so they're like easy to chew. So you can add uh, as much as you want. <laughs> there are not fixed measures uh, for this. So after, so at the beginning, uh, uh, when I just put all together, uh, you can feel the texture was more li liquefied, but now after almost 10 minutes, uh, seeming, letting it rest, now, um, the the seeds the ground seeds um, absorb uh, a lot of the a lot of the liquid. liquid the tomato and the juice so now it's a little bit thicker than before and now I'm gonna try it I haven't added water at all be my guest thank Please. you. I think it's perfect. Absolutely perfect, Vero. And if you went right, huh? Oh I my God, I'm so I'm good. Very happy. This um, is so yummy. So if you went a little bit like, um, not liquefied it, but a little bit thinner, like not too coarse, you can just uh, smash a little bit longer. But I think I like the way it is now. I love the way it yeah, is now. Yeah, and we don't need water at all. So uh, as I said at the beginning, don't add the water just uh, at once because your recipe uh, said, uh, says that you need to use water. Just uh, start to play little by little with the liquids. And of course, I start to play with this, for example, the tomato that adds a lot of uh, water and the juice because they are very tasty and adds a lot of flavor. And when, if it is very, very thick for you and you want it thinner, then start to use, uh, add water little by little. But right now, we're going to get it the way it is now. Yeah. But now I, I oh, oh, that's wet right. a little, a little that's bit. That's right. Bit. So now we add our chives and coriander. And we are going to, to use the moltajete to, to serve it. We are not going to change it to another uh, vessel or bowl or whatever, because here it looks like very nice. A moltajete is a very nice serving vessel, even if you don't use it for grinding. Mm -hmm. you, can, uh, you can serve sauces in it, you can serve dips in it, or you can even cook like meats and stuff in it and stick it in the oven, put your meats and your your nopales and your shrimp or whatever. That's a popular taqueria thing where you get a molcajete, right? Yeah. So you cannot know your art here. My art. And I mean, you are going to see this at the end of the, the, the workshop, but yeah, you can put some uh, totopos or, uh, or nachos, <laughs> if you want to call it like that, and you are going to dip it. Do you want to try it? Thank you. So I hope it looks the way I look at it here in, in person. It might not look the same. <laughs> because sometimes the computer changed the colors. And believe me, it's like, trust me, it looks really amazing here. It does. Reality. Beautiful. So we are going to take this baby to the other side. OK. And yeah. we're going to start working on our pitian, because that's going to be our main dish. So for the pitian, first we're going to clean. Yeah, first we're going to clean. 
in the meantime, while we clean, do you have any questions? Do you do you have any comments? Do you have any um, pressing uh, pressing uh, existential things that we can help you with? If there's someone cooking, dame la, with us. ponme la de esta porque ahí está limpiando. <laughs> Yes, we are cleaning. <laughs> we are very clean. <laughs> uh, pressing issues, existential questions. Um, you want to know what I'm doing tomorrow? Um, you want to know what Veronica is doing on Sunday? Um, yeah. Is, is, is Rick, Rick, is tell, Rick, is, Rick is saying that uh, you are the perfect team for a TV cooking show. Thank you, Rick. Do you want to produce Thank us? You. <laughs> Do you know anybody at Netflix? <laughs> Come on, Rick, hook us up. Talk. Okay. Okay, so um, let's see, what, what are we doing? I'm having a sip of wine and then I'm gonna tell you about the pipian. Before you eat, all that food and you were saying that the uh, the video might not show the true colors maybe felix can take a, a photo with the with the real camera and we can post it uh, to the website felix is already nodding yes yes okay. yes he sir already, harry he already did it <laughs> yes sir okay. harry we we should thank very much to felix because he is uh, behind all this uh, he settled us for, for the workshop and he is managing uh, like three cameras. So that's why you can see the different things we are doing in the stove and in this area. And so we are like, he is part of the team. He is definitely part of the team. We are in forever debt to Felix. So he gets to eat all the food. Another question is uh, uh, time-wise, uh, can you estimate uh, more or less how long uh, the rest of the workshop will be so that the audience participants know more or less. We basically have only 40 minutes left uh, airing time, but. Uh, I, I think only four minutes. No. Yeah, that's three hours. Oh, 40. Oh, yes. No, we'll be done in 40. All right. Good. Maybe before, but yeah. Yeah, maybe before. Excellent. Because we have a lot of things already prepared. So, um, okay, now I'm going to prepare the pipian. But, um, okay, see, before we start preparing the pipian, Veronica has to get started on something that she's doing. Um, for the next dish. Yeah, for the next dish. So I'm gonna start to uh, roast uh, the chile poblano. This very nice guy. Uh, for those, uh, may, some of you may be fam familiar with the so-called chile nogada. And this is the chili they use for that dish, a very traditional one, one of like the icons of the Mexican nation thing. But here we are gonna use that for other dish and we need to roast it uh, in the fire. And it takes a little uh, while. So that's why I'm gonna start with that. And then Claudia is going to prepare the pipian. So just, um, so you can see the beginning of this, uh, Technique, you can use the fire. I have heard, I think, how do you have to use your oven to do this, right? If I'm correct, if I remember well. So yeah, because you, Harry doesn't have a, a gas stove. He has an a electric stove. Yeah. So if you don't yeah, have in, a in, gas stove, if you have an electric stove, you can stick it in the oven in um, high heat. You can also use a... So, so yeah, like a like a like a torch. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where is like it? like what you yeah. use to make creme brulee, but exactly. that's a little bit more um, sophisticated. I don't yeah. know that the average uh, home cook has one. I don't. I have. No, of course you do. You're awesome. I just yeah. So yeah, basically is to put the the chili on the fire and. Uh, Roast it uh, until it gets very brown and start to blister. So I'm going to show the the process. The process in little by little, but in the meantime, Claudia is going to start with the pipian. Right. So for the pipian, um, you know, pipian is um, 
it's a dish that definitely has pre-Hispanic roots, but um, you know, in this version, we are using things like garlic and onion and cinnamon and cumin and uh, uh, sesame seeds. So it's definitely a mestizo dish. So it's something that evolved from what perhaps we think um, was a, an ancient um, Mexico, Mexico, well, Mex Mesoamerican dish, the, definitely in the um, in the Yucatan Maya area because they use a lot of the pumpkin seeds. Uh, well, we also use it in Central Mexico, but. So pipián basically relates to the name of the pepita, which is the, what we call the uh, pumpkin seed. So if it's a pipián, it, it has pumpkin seeds. There are a lot of other different kind of moles and, and cremoles and, and cacahuatados, other dishes that are similar that use uh, just peanuts or almonds or you know just sesame or things. But if it does have pumpkin seeds, more than likely it's gonna be a pipián. And um. Uh, sorry, so no, we bring it. You, but um, uh, there are uh, different ways of cooking them, and you can find pipians in different areas of the country, but you can also find it in Guatemala. And sometimes it is called pepian. I think in Guatemala they call it pepian, and also in Yucatan. So it is basically, I mean, with all these varieties, but it, it implies that it has the pumpkin seed. But I have heard that, for example, in El Peru, they have also a uh, pepian, but they are using uh, the choclo, no? the, the maize kernels, to, to do a, a dish called pepian. Right, so, and then what do you have in your hand? Yeah, so uh, what we are going to prepare now is the red pepian, pepian rojo, and that's why we're using tomatoes, red tomatoes that in Spanish uh, are called jitomates here in Highlands. But we also have green uh, pipián. And green pipián is made, um, we don't use these tomatoes for those, but we use, um, but we <laughs> use uh, tomatoes like tomatillo, mil tomate, uh, this green tomato, not to be confused with other types of tomatoes that they said they're green but maybe there are just a, a green tomato, a green tomato, but not this kind of tomato that are covered with this very dry um, peel. Husk. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a little husk and then you open it. And actually it's not really a tomato. They call it tomate because they didn't know what else to call it, but it's actually in the, in the, in the Fisilis, um, uh family botanically, which is the same family as the gooseberry. So if any of you are from the Northern United States or from Europe, you know gooseberries. So gooseberries are little and, and yellow and they look just like this, but little and yellow. And then this guy is big and green, but it's in the same botanical family. We also so, have the very small ones, the tiny ones. Yeah, the, the tiny ones, one. which are almost like green and purple. Uh, and that's what they grow in the milpas. So this is another milpa product um, that, that um, is widely used in Mexico for green salsas, green pipianes, green mole. Um, it's just difficult to find it outside of Mexico, really. Um, in the States, sometimes we find it at specialty markets. Um, they do can it, but I would not recommend using canned uh, tomatoes. They call them tomatillos. I would not recommend using them because they're not really that good. You can find it in Guatemala as well. This is like a Mesoamerican product. But yes. It's not just in Mexico. Just For sure. So what we're gonna do with the pipián is we already cooked our chicken, right? So pipián, uh, it can be made with uh, chicken, but also with pork, or if you're vegetarian, you can do it with just squash or mushrooms or potatoes or a combination of all of those things. Here, we just boiled some chicken as you see in your notes um, and then you reserve the broth. For the sauce, we're gonna have the chiles, right? Uh, which we're gonna toast like we toasted um, the chile pasillas for the sauce. And we already have our tomatoes uh, chard, our onion chard, and our garlic chard, and we have our pumpkin seeds already toasted. 
like we did for the Sikil pack. So that through the magic of television, we're just gonna roast our chiles real quick because they take a second. I mean, they really do take seconds. So again, we have um, chile anchos. Uh, we got them out. And then we have a um, couple of little chile moritas, uh, jalapeno, I mean, uh, uh, chipotle moritas. And then we have the guajillos, guajillo chiles. Um, yeah. So do you want me to take out the seeds? That was not pinned so they can see how they came out, right? No, it's, it's got it. Okay. It's no. got it. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you want, just take out the core. Don't do it with your hands. Do as I say, not as I do. Take out as many of the seeds as you want. If you want to leave some seeds, that gives it a little spice. And then we're going to toast them, okay? So we're just going to toast them really quickly like we did before so that they just kind of get um, fragrant and slightly uh, changing color. You know, you just, you just want them to start smelling like chile, release their oils and their flavors, and that's what you do. In the meantime, we're gonna get all these other things in the blender, okay? So we're gonna get our onion. Um, let me chop the, the ends off. The onion, we just kind of quartered it um, to, to roast it on the comal because it's a lot easier just to, to quarter it. Then that way the, the end keeps it together and it doesn't just, you know, break all over the place. But, you know, then you wanna just take out the core and maybe take out a little of the stem and chunk it in your blender. The garlic we peeled, but um, you know, other people were, we were discussing earlier that other people prefer not to peel their garlic before they roast it. Again, that's a matter of what your tradition in your family might be like. If you wanna peel it, you peel it. If you wanna roast it with the peel on and then peel it, rock and roll. And then we have the tomatoes. I'm just gonna take out the core really quickly. Stick all of that stuff in our blender. We have to pour three cups of water. And then um, what we're gonna do is we're going to heat up the three cups of broth and we're gonna add our chiles to the broth to kind of soak in there and, and you know, give the, the nice, lovely chili flavor to the broth. While we do that, we're gonna toast our spices. The toasting of the spices, I think it's a sort of a, maybe like a Moorish thing like Veronica was talking about because that's where the, these sort of spices came from. If you think about curry, you can call this sort of like a Mexican curry. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a blend of spices and herbs and aromatics that are roasted and cooked and then you add a meat. So it's, it's you know, that's kind of how I've explained Mexican food to my English boyfriend. Um, that way he eats it a lot happier. Oh, it's a curry, is it? So it's all good. Um, we want to do this, and then um, then we're gonna roast our our seeds. So our chiles are gonna go into the warm broth. You're we're gonna do like we did before, where we're gonna. Okay, so we already took out the a ver si está listo. Abre te sesamo. We're going to cut them into small pieces so that it's easier for them to um, to blend. See, we don't want them to get <coughs> so toasted. This one's ready. This guy is ready. This guy is ready. <coughs> uh huh. Uh huh. You want to take out the you want to take out the the stem, right? No, está bien. We're Mexican women. We can touch the chilies with our hand. <laughs> <coughs> uh 
<coughs> just don't breathe them. Wow. So you are going to boil them here about 10 minutes. Meanwhile, you're going to blend your um, vegetables. No, here. So this is the result of the roasted chili poblano. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, here. So you can see it is like it uh, has a lot of uh, brown or black spots, almost entire chili. So it is easier. I mean, once you do that, uh, so, I mean, many uh, in many houses and uh, many families, what they do is to put this inside a plastic bag. So it sweats, it sweats, and then uh, you start to peel it. And because we are very friendly with the environment, we prefer not to use the plastic bags that can add like toxic, uh, toxic uh, things to, to the food. So we are just going to peel it. Uh, or you can do a, like you can this. do a paper bag. You can sweat yeah. it in a paper bag or you can sweat it. You can put it in a bowl and cover it with a lid and it'll sweat like that. Yeah. But so uh, you can see how uh, after it's charred like that, you can see how easily it just peels. It just comes off. You can even just do it like, you know, rub it off with a paper towel, rub it off with a cloth towel. Can, It'll just come right off. You can also use uh, gloves to protect your hands. We yeah, are kind of face. very savage, uh, savage women, uh, Mexican women, and we do this <laughs> way. We're idiots. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you can see I'm removing the whole black thing. And some people also put this under the the broiler or in the oven, no? No, in the water. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, they uh, help uh, to peel the chili with the water in your sink, but uh, it takes a lot of flavor of the chili. So we prefer not to do that technique and just like, just like this. Yeah, after that, uh, as uh, we did with the other chilies, we have to, to open it. That's why, I mean, I love this chili and I love all the dishes that include this chili, but when you have to cook something that where you need like 10 chilies of these ones or five, and you have to do this, this process, I, I really- I, I prefer I not to. Yeah, I get yeah, a me little, too. little bit lazy about this. Yeah, I mean, this is what you make, like you, if you've heard of chile relleno, you know, yeah. you stuff them with cheese or with meat. But yeah, I mean, if you're feeding six people and you want to do two chilies per people, yeah. that's like, wow, that's, you got to do this 12 times. That is how we start to lose traditions because there are many uh, uh, people don't want to to prepare the chili nogada anymore because this is a lot of work. For it's them. a lot of yeah. work. It's a yeah. lot of work. So as I said, I'm going, uh, we have to remove also the seeds and the grains from this one. I'm going to, like in the dry chilies, I'm going to move to the other side of the kitchen to do that. And I'm going to let the space to Claudia so she can keep working with, uh, with the pipián. So next for the pipián, we have to toast the peanuts the sesame seeds and the spices. So it's tricky. I probably would rather do this in a pan, but I think we're using all the pans. Is this pan used? Oh, no? Is a, no, this, this, this is the command. And yeah. Let's use a pan. Because you know what? You're gonna have to, um, for the sesame seeds, see. right? Yeah. yeah, you're gonna have to see. For the cacao, okay. Mm -hmm. So for the peanuts, you can throw them in the command. This is, you know, these guys are gonna roast very quickly. And of course, as you know, peanuts, they do have a lot of oil. So they start releasing their oil just like the pumpkin seeds. You want your your uh, command or your, your frying pan in the middle, in the mid heat. 
Mm -hmm. And then you could, they're going to start toasting. You don't want them burnt. You want them just shiny, right? So you, you want them to just to get to the point where they start shiny. We're going to start releasing the oils. And so the seeds, you want to do the same. The seeds are, are going to just take seconds, especially the cumin seeds. They're going to take seconds, and you're going to just start smelling the spices. So again, you're doing that to release the oils. The spices. The spices are um, cumin seeds, cloves, all spice and cinnamon. So all spices is, is Mesoamerican, cumin seeds, cloves, and cinnamon are um, um, European. So again, it's like a really nice blend of uh, a really nice mestizo blend of, of uh, spices. So the spices are just going to start getting fragrant. They're going to start releasing their oils. Here's the, the, the peanuts are already getting shiny. Can you see that they're shiny? I um, mean, you know, I don't know if you can, but um, they're just no. getting shiny. They, it, they're gonna take like minutes. And then really the, the sesame seeds and the spices are gonna take seconds. So for that, I'm gonna use the pan because then again, you know, like with the pumpkin seeds, you wanna be able to manipulate with your hand. It's really easy. To, I mean, it's really hard to do the, um, the command with your hands. So we're just going to do that. Anybody have any questions? Oh, you want to show them how you do the rajas? Yeah, after cleaning the chile poblano and removing the seeds and veins, as you can see, I didn't remove all the seeds. This is a chili that is a tricky one. Uh, actually, it has a very sweet taste, but sometimes uh, you can get some that are hot, and those are like very salty, but they, they do they exist. exist. Uh, but because of this kind of um, sweet taste, it, adds, it adds, uh, adds a very nice flavor to, to the food. So you want to stripe, strip, strip, strip. strip. It. You can cut it like in, in like chop, but uh, we use it uh, quite frequently in strips that we call uh, rajas. When you uh, hear the name rajas poblanas, you will have something like this in your soup or in your rice or in your food, whatever. In your omelet or in your. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have our peanuts now in the um, blender with the, with the vegetables. And now we're gonna do our uh, sesame seeds. Okay, guys, this is gonna be like seconds, okay? So our pan is hot. And we're gonna toss in the sesame seeds. These little guys have a lot of oil, as you know, sesame oil is a thing. And um, they are very small and they're very fried. So we gotta be super quick at uh, getting them toasted. So we, you wanna start like tossing them around right away. Just like the pumpkin seed, they're gonna, they're gonna start popping. And because they have less weight, they are going to start like really jump they all jump. over they your jump. stuff and your kitchen. What else? What kind of pressing questions can we answer for you, Harry? Doesn't look like there are any questions at this moment. Do we have any people watching us at this point? Or yes. Is it just you and Mac? <laughs> we? <laughs> we, we are 41, so. Okay. Thank you guys for sticking with us. This is fantastic, 41 people, yay. Can you let us know if there is someone cooking with us? Are they are all just watching. I think most of the people are watching right now. So uh, okay. at least I don't see anyone who specifically uh, indicated that they are uh, cooking. Mm -hmm. 
Plus. We're watching. We're watching, but I don't have the a kitchen in my office. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a bummer, eh? And Tuisco was saying that looks awesome. I must try tomorrow when it's not 4 a.m. <laughs> oh, Tuisco, thank you for staying up. That's great. Yeah, go to, uh, what's it called? Harry Los Buos? Dos Tecolotes. Dos Tecolotes. Where you can also find tomatillos. So not only Mexico and Guatemala and the States, but uh, in downtown Helsinki, you can find tomatillos. Yeah, that's brilliant. I'm so happy about those tecolotes. Okay. So uh, in the meantime, that Claudia is uh, playing with the Sesame Street. Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So sorry. Yeah. <laughs> she did say Sesame Street. Da, okay. da, 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 da. You understand it, right? <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Says some seeds. And um, I'm going to start to prepare some ingredients for the next recipe. That is, um, we call it here uh, for uh, our workshop, uh, um, guisado de milpa, like milpa dish. Uh, but actually we don't call it like that, like in Mexico, we call it like just uh, calabacitas with elotes. No, because we are going to use elotes and we are going to use uh, calabacitas, squash. We can use zucchini or we can use this uh, very traditional from Mexico, branded calabacitas, especially from Highland Mexico, because you don't find this uh, quite often in Yucatan. In Yucatan, they have a very delicious squash that we don't find it here, sadly. But yeah, we are going to use this kind of squash. Any summer squash will work. If you have yellow squash or zucchini type squash, if it's squash from the summer soft skin, it will work. Yeah. So basically what you want is to get the, the grains of the maize. Uh, At this point is corn. Corn, okay. Can you see it? Our cameraman is busy taking pictures of the dishes. So I'm showing, I'm using this camera. That's okay, Felix, don't worry about that. And uh, I mean, here in Mexico, you can get this in the market just already like this. But to show you how to get to that point, we get one um, uh, corn and I'm going to clean it so we can, uh, Degrade it? How do you call that? Shock it. Shock well, I mean, you shock it, which means this is what you're doing. You're shocking it. And then you um, take it off the cob. You want to remove all the... All the hairs. Hairs. Oh, sorry. What the fuck? My... My sesame seeds are not as fast as I thought. <laughs> They're Maybe behaving themselves. It is hot. Yeah, it is hot. It, they're going to start going crazy in like five seconds. Okay. And you see me here? Yeah, I think so. So you just need to do this, and uh, I think it's easier with a to use a bowl because if you just do it in the board, uh, it's easy to lose the. Kernels. Kernels. So it's just like to do this and that's it. But if you can get it already like corn, like this, so just go, go for it. And now I'm going to keep doing this on the other side of the kitchen. And I've already got my chiles ready to rock. So 
So they boiled in the, in the broth. And then we're gonna put them in the blender with the tomatoes, onions, garlic, peanuts. Right, and then um, I added the spices to the sesame seeds just to expedite the process over here. So I'm smelling the club. I'm smelling the allspice. This is all like lovely, lovely, lovely looking. So now we're gonna throw our um, sesame seeds and spices into the blender. You can see how they start changing color and they start popping up. I can smell the allspice. I can smell the cloves. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And so now we're going to put it all into the blender. Lovely. And we're going to blend it and then you're going to add the you're going to reserve the the water from where you the the broth from where you soak the chiles so that you can use it as you need it so here we go So when it starts like protesting, then you need to add some of the liquid. Liquid. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Um, liquid, and then we of course need our pumpkin seeds, which is what makes pipiam pipiam, right? So now we're gonna add our pumpkin seeds and it's gonna thicken it quite a bit. So then we're gonna need to uh, use our spatula. You're losing it. It's really not a difficult dish to make. It just requires a little time of preparation to roast all your things. But once everything's roasted and sorted, it's done. <laughs> More chili water. I'm oh, sorry. It's okay. That is all the chili water. Chili broth. Better, you want to start chopping your uh, yes. squashes? Yeah. So, um, we need just to get in there. To dice the squash. So, you just, like any other squash, you just, just remove the, the ends of the squash. And you can decide how big you want your dice, as big as you want. So this uh, dish uh, can be, I mean, we have the so-called uh, uh, fiestas taqueras, or reuniones taqueras. There is a- uh, Taco party, Taco ta Tuesday. It is like uh, everybody uh, prepare like a dish, a traditional dish, like cochinita pibil, or uh, potatoes uh, with onions, or, calabacitas con elotes, like what we are preparing here. And we have different cazuelas and it is like a buffet and it is about just to prepare your own tacos.
Creo que es otra. Ah, perdón. No, no. De ver? hecho, todas. Está bien thick. Sí. One, one question from the audience. Uh, Rick is asking, did you pop the pumpkin seeds this time? Yes. Yes, we did pop the pumpkin seeds. We just didn't do it again because for time constraints, but yes. The pumpkin seeds have to be popped and, uh, and the, the peanuts have to be roasted. And the um, sesame seeds have to be They also pop, but you know, they're just, yeah. We do. So about the calabacitas with the lotus, uh, you can also uh, uh, cook some rice. Uh, you can have just a plain white uh, rice, or uh, if you can uh, want something more sophisticated, you can cook the rice uh, the way you like it. And then put these uh, calabacitas and, uh, with the lotus together, and that's it. Very <laughs> Okay, your pipián is beautiful. Um, you want to see the uh, consistency of it is not quite thin, not quite thick. It's like a runny peanut butter sort of uh, consistency. No. Donde está? Okay. Oh, we're frozen. We're frozen. We're frozen. Now? No, yeah, no. <laughs> you are not frozen. You are watching us? We are all watching you. Uh, we uh, we heard the blending occur and then yeah, it's still there. It's okay. all good. Okay, thank all right. you, Max. Okay, the so upper, now we're gonna- The upper add... camera seems seems to be frozen. That's what, the, but now it's not anymore. We're good but, yeah. By okay, the way, good. this is okay, like- Okay, so you can see- master, This is like Master Chef Mexico. You have now right. four minutes left. All right. All we're gonna do now is um, fry our um, pipián, and Veronica is gonna make the calabacitas. Go ahead, Veronica, make the calabacitas. What? Move it. You move it. Yeah. So we are going to heat some uh, oil. You can use a, a mix of oil and butter, or just butter, or ghee, or whatever you, you want. Not much. We like to cook with not that much oil in our food. And um, first, I mean, for, Ooh, for the calabas. Yeah. Do you have something to So there you have to be very careful and actually uh, not um, the pot shouldn't be that hot because otherwise it'll start to to jump like a, it looks like an eruption of the volcano. Yeah, it and, is. Yeah, you can burn your arms, for example. So uh, Be careful with that, and uh, the sooner, I mean, as soon as you put the pipián in the pot, start to move it, so uh, you can control this uh, kind of erosion effect. 
right? In the meantime, I'm heating the oil. So for this recipe, we just need the corn, the calabacitas, uh, onions, uh, chopped onions, and very fine chopped garlic here, and our uh, rajas poblanas, no? uh, chile poblano strips, and some salt, and that's it. As you can see, all what we are cooking are very easy dishes to cook. And so they are uh, common in the Mexican household, at least here in the Highlands, Highlands, Mexico. I cannot say that in Yucatan they're uh, frequently this kind of PPM because it's different as we mentioned, right? So once um, the oil is heated, you add uh, your onions and your garlic and you sort of air uh, it until it, uh, I mean, you can smell the fragrance. And here you're gonna add your chicken to the pipián. And you can do, you know, big pieces or small pieces, or you can shred it and then you can use it in, you know, um, enchiladas or tacos, put in a, in a tortilla, make a po boy. Veronica had that idea. Why don't we make some pipián porvos? I was like, that sounds great. Yeah, you need to pull, uh, pull the, the meat. Pull the meat, shred the meat. meat. And then when you serve the pepian, like right now pretty much it's done. You just need to do it so that it heats up the meat on the inside. Keep an eye on it so it doesn't dry up. If it needs more uh, broth, you still have some broth from where you cook the chicken. And then, you know, you can serve it with just hot tortillas. You can serve it over uh, white rice or brown rice, any kind of rice you like. So, you know, uh, when the onions and garlic are ready, when you see this kind of, uh, uh, no. <laughs> shiny, translucent. Shiny, translucent uh, texture like almost like a like kind of black glass and also you can feel the the smell it smells really really nice so now you can add your calabacitas And the spirit by incorporates the squash with the onion and the garlic. Cover it a little bit for like maybe a few minutes. And we are about to be done very soon. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of start out. Uh, can't move the, the, can move the other dishes here. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to grab a uh, dish with this? See? Mm -hmm. So basically we are like cooking in a very, I mean, like an apartment kitchen. 
So you can see this is a very like a uh, home not, friendly. Yeah, exactly. Nothing sophisticated. Uh, you can prefer that with common utensils that you have at home. Besides for the molcajete, but you already know you can use mortar or blenders or processors. And uh, the uh, service that we prepare are for a group of uh, about four people, more or less, depending how hungry you are, how much you eat. But yeah, more or less the, the, the idea. And after a little while, you can add the corn. I start to stir it. It is so sad that you cannot like you cannot feel the smells. It is sad. But lucky you that you don't have to clean the kitchen. That is true. <laughs> And it will be great to share this, uh, all this food as we have shared this uh, in other years in Helsinki, sharing the table, all the participants. So I'm gonna add just like uh, one teaspoon of salt, not much. And some pepper. Uh, yeah, pepper. Yeah, that's true. The smell of the pipian is really amazing. It's amazing. Pipian is one of my favorite Mexican dishes. Green or red. Green or red and green and red. Mm -hmm. Get some uh, fresh, hot corn tortillas for this dish. Or yeah, like Veronica said, some rice. Rice works. Yes. We are very happy that you guys joined us today. We're almost done. I know you're tired. I know you're sick of us. We've been doing this since eight this morning. <laughs> and we're hungry <laughs> but we are so thankful for uh matt and max and harry for inviting us to do this um you know very fun thing and uh yeah i do hope that um in the future we can actually do it at the playa so we can all have the food and we can all share a table because like you know veronica explained earlier in our presentation Food is communal, food is a feast, food is a cultural binder, food is in a, a way in which we exchange ideas, we exchange traditions, um, we share ideas, we share everything. So um, it's, it's the glue, right? Food is the glue that binds cultures together. And we are just so thrilled to share our culture, our traditions, our silliness, and uh, I, we are just so thrilled so uh, very much thank you guys. Um, Veronica is gonna show you how her lovely dish is gonna turn out next to the pipian. So um, basically I'm just going to add uh, this uh, epazote uh, herb uh, that Claudia mentioned as quilite. So this is very traditional from Thailand, Mexico. Again, you don't find this in uh, many other parts of the country. It is a very, uh, strong, it has a very strong taste. So we don't need to add uh, that much. We don't chop it because uh, because of the strong flavor. So we just add like a couple of uh, leaves. leaves. And then we, yeah, we incorporate all the ingredients, stir it, and we just cover it and let it seem uh, two yeah. more minutes until the simmer, until the, uh, the squash and the corns are tender 
and that's it. Grab your tortilla. Yeah, this is amazing with tortilla. You can do a po' boy with, um, you can make a po' boy with this, but I definitely prefer tortilla. And something, I mean, as you can see all the, uh, all the dishes that we prepared today are um, based, uh, based uh, mainly in the milpa products, as Claudia explained uh, early today. No? We, we were using the seeds of the squash, with, uh, corn, uh, squash itself, and these elites that also grow around the milpa. So you can see we have we want to present some examples of uh, the dishes that we ate uh, in a daily basis in this area of the mm. Mesoamerica and tomato, Mexico. tomatillo, mm. chile, everything kind of grows in and around the milpa. Mm -hmm. You have a chicken that eats the bugs in the milpa. I mean, it's all really like a beautifully integrated ecosystem. Yeah. So it's yeah. Harry, what do you think? Are we done? We I know we're late. No, we are pretty, all good. We are in very okay. Does anybody have any more questions or comments or um you know anything that you want to add or say or a lot of people thanking you for the workshop. Um not too many questions or comments, but uh, thank you guys. This is great. I'm glad you stuck around with us. I hope that you um, learned something. I hope that you will want to cook uh, some of these recipes. If you have any questions um, about ingredients, uh, finding them or techniques or anything, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Veronica is like the busiest person on earth. But um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, yeah, there, there you go. That's your, your guisado de milpa. Mm -hmm. Calabacitas with poblano, corn, garlic, onion, and a little bit of chile. No le pusiste chile, verdad? Actually, it has no chile in it. Chile Eche poblano, yeah. You can add some uh, fresh cheese, even goat cheese at the top when serving it. So, and all, I mean, you can mention what kind of cheese they cheese Yeah, like, you know, depending cheese. on where you are, if you can find some like dry Mexican uh, cheese, like such a like cotija or añejo, that's great. Um, Asiago will do. Um, some, uh, you know, fresh cheese, such as, um, you know, fresh crumbly uh, goat cheese will do just as a garnish on top of the, of, of the squash dish. It's nice, it melts, it, it, it adds a creamy tanginess to it. And um, so you can see how that lovely dish would be served um, next to our um, beautiful salsa. And our amazing, gorgeous, incredibly smelling sikil pak. So, you know, that's a, that's a meal, right? That's a Mexican meal. And um, if you plan your, uh, your menu right, it's all very simple. It's all easy to do. You just need to plan it with time so that you're not rushing around with the last four minutes of the presentation. So if you also, I mean, if you want to uh, cook our, the recipes with uh, cook to, uh, today, and you have questions, you can also contact us and we will be happy, very happy to answer them and help you uh, cooking Mexican uh, food. Yep. Thank you everybody for sticking around with us. Thank you. Excellent, excellent workshop. Muchas gracias, Claudia y Veronica. Que chido. <laughs> Gracias, Jarrito. You, you are superstars and you definitely need your own TV show. As Shanti was just uh, writing in the chat. All right. And I, quote, and I quote, thank you, Claudia and Veronica. Looking forward to your Netflix show. Okay. Sounds awesome. And, and, well, it's and Berta was writing, se antoja. Muchas gracias también por promover nuestros platillos. Saludos desde Ciudad de México. 
Gracias, Berta. Aquí estamos también, Chilanga Banda. Y, y, y thank you, Shanti. I'm looking forward to your talk. It's going to be yeah. awesome. Yeah, that, you know? that'll, be, that'll be tomorrow, actually. I'll be on, talking about, I'll be talking on about an airplane, tomorrow. but through the magic of television, I'll watch it later. Perfect. And uh, thank you, Rick. And please be sure to uh, hook us up with Netflix. We're ready. <laughs> so tomorrow, remember to use the uh, right Zoom link posted on the webpage that says day two. So we'll start 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. That's uh, GMT minus four. Goodman Martinez Thompson minus two. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Muchas gracias, Claudia y Veronica. Matt, Max. Thank you, Matt and Max. I hope you're still there. Oh, hello. Thank you so much. This was awesome. It was awesome, but torturous at the same time. Yeah, I we know. Were. I wish I could send you, uh, you know, uh, uh, Uber, uh, Uber Eats to you right oh, now. But that would be great. We'll mm -hmm. just have yeah, to do is, it next year, unfair. friends. This is unfair. This is really unfair that you torturous get, get to eat all this stuff now. Yeah, well, Felix, <laughs> it's all for Felix. Alpha Felix, yeah, Felix is, is the unsung hero. Here. Yeah. Cameraman, and cameraman, and director, and producer. <laughs> Felix, Felix. He might be sending the cameras. Yay. <laughs> well, Gracias, bon appetit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hari, and we'll see everyone tomorrow uh, right before four. Yep. We'll be there. Perfecto. Hasta luego. Okay. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Ciao. you.